think it's safe to talk. I think we're alone now. <laughs> oh, I'm so tempted to go on a divergent area and talk about that documentary called I Think We're Alone Now, but we'll save that for an audio-only episode because we got to get through this uh, this presentation today because uh, I got 34 slides and I know that's easily going to fill an hour, possibly close in an hour and a half, and I don't want to tempt Adobe Connect to uh, play its wiles with us uh, with this technology. Uh, so that man below me on the Brady Bunch screen uh, for this video episode of the Lean Into Art Cast, that's Rob Stenzinger of interactive-storyteller.com. And the man above me in this uh, very simple game of tic-tac-toe is... Uh, <laughs> Sutter Square. Yeah. Jersey Drozd of comicsaregreat.com and uh, one of the co-deans of leanintoart.com. Dot com. And Rob, I am very excited about this topic today. I am very excited about this presentation. Uh, I, I got a feeling that this one is going to work as good in audio as it does in video. But uh, obviously, I've got a lot of visual examples to make my case. Uh, this mini, this this is a sketch. This is an outline. This is a preliminary take at what I hope to turn into a full-on workshop for Lean Into Art. Uh, and this this is uh, entitled Understanding 80s Cartoons and, in parentheses, and how it can improve your storytelling. I thought about calling this one Five Ways to Improve Your Storytelling and leave the 80s cartoons thing out of it. You know, do that whole, um, uh, oh, what is it? That 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 uh, juicy headline that gets a lot of link clicks. Yeah, link baiting. What? Yeah, You're... but... <laughs> You know, I, I hover over that ring and I look at it and I think about what I could do if I had the power of the great enemy. And then I think now nah, it would ultimately corrupt me. <laughs> so I, I, I lurch away and say, now, nah, you know what? A, a gentle, peaceful hobbit is much better equipped to deal with that kind of burden than uh, than me. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a man after all, and men are tempted by power. So um, I should warn people that I'm going to be doing a lot of talking on this one. Rob, you're going to have to like you know, really push me out of the way. Uh, cause I've, this is one, I've got a lot of, I got a lot of fire under, under me on this one. And it's, and this is also, <laughs> I was thinking about this as I was putting the presentation together. Um, this is a topic that I'm really fired up about and I'm really passionate about. And I suspect, uh, this is a very safe topic for me to get passionate about because ultimately not that many people feel that strongly about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a guy on a, on a soapbox going like Goodyear tires come on you know everybody else is like whatever this, this, the store is having a, a clearance on onion flavored pudding and uh, you're like oh mine <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's really it oh cottage cheese two for one it is the greatest day ever no. um, and actually um, I think it, it would have been a very appropriate title to well you could list any any um I don't know. You could just say uh, analyzing animated uh, entertainment to improve your storytelling. Yeah. It's, it's and that, that's the thesis today. That's the big idea that we're going to walk away with. For those who don't care about 80s cartoons and are like, whatever, uh, what this really is about is me making a case for how studying how, the kind of writing that was found in a lot of these cartoons, and I got some modern examples as well, how uh, it, it has improved the way I think about writing and how I think it could be used in a variety of types of storytelling, whether, whether it's film, whether it's uh, comics, whether it's just prose writing. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that these cartoons do that uh, are awesome food for thought, that are really good, uh, what, what's the word, um, uh, cases, scenarios, uh, sure. uh, use cases, studies. case studies. Thank you. Jeez. All right, so let's kick into it then. So um, I'm going to do the old presentation thing and say yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to qualify everything I'm about to say by saying that yes, I'm a big dork who uh, has arrested development issues, and I grew up on all these cartoons that we're going to talk about today. Uh, and I continue to watch these cartoons to this day, and I'm always on the hunt for new cartoons to uh, watch both for entertainment purposes and analysis. I'm in the middle right now of watching season three of the TV series Gem. Truly Outrageous. Do you remember this one? It was an 80s rock cartoon, uh, feminine heroine. Uh, it, was, it was based on a, a doll line for girls. It was like sort of like Barbie meets pop rock. Yeah. Um, and, uh, season three. Was, uh, she has sort of like uh, uh, superpowers that, that are, are related to some technology and earrings. 
right? Some or some yes. uniquely powerful earring objects. She well, it, the the neat thing is, it's, it's a very rooted series in that she well rooted, yeah, right. She has a computer, a sentient computer that is uh, over over the airwaves is tied to her earrings, and when she activates the earrings by saying Showtime Synergy, Synergy is the name of her computer, um, it can activate a hologram over top of her to turn her into the rock star gem. So it's sort of that whole idea of the Clark Kent Superman, uh, uh, Bruce Wayne Batman transformation of the character. Now I'm a super character because I'm a pop star, uh, but she's also the band's manager. And all the drama that comes out of that, like uh, she she's dating a guy named Rio, but Rio kind of likes Jem, so he's kind of cheating on her with her. Um, and then in the third season, it gets really interesting where they introduce a third faction because there's good guys and bad guys. There's the Misfits, which are the bad band, and Jem and the Holograms, which are the good band. And this new German band shows up called The Stingers, which is run by this guy called Riot, who's playing uh, Jem and Pizzazz, the leader of the Misfits, against each other for his own ends. Uh, really interesting dynamics going on with that. And so, like, when I, I, I tweeted about this when I was watching, I was like, oh my gosh, this is fascinating. Whole new uh, character dynamic going on and team dynamic between uh, these three different teams in season three. Must study. And I meant it. So that's that's all I'm saying here is that I, I watch this stuff for pure entertainment pleasure, but I'm always, always picking it apart and analyzing it because I think it's fascinating kinds of storytelling. Um, and all this studying to like sort of like uh, justify myself to say that I'm not just some kind of uh, fascinated nerd. I put all these theories into practice in a ser uh, an anthology that I launched in 2007 called Sugary Cereals at SugaryCereals.com. Uh, ran for about a year and some change with uh, daily updates of all sorts of comics. Like uh, if you look in the upper right there, there's uh, the Barrel King from Dreamform Defenders by Chet Lucero. Uh, in the lower left is uh, Daring Dodo by Matt Putnam Pouliot. Amazing comic. Uh, and it's still on SugarSeries.com. And then a couple characters I introduced in a comic called Equalizers of the Divide. And actually, I'm starting up Sugar Seals again uh, with the front. And I hope to add more comics to it soon. But one of the things that I did with that uh, that anthology is I, you know, talked with all the creators to help them design their stories to feel like these old '80s cartoons. And what does that even mean? We'll get to that. Uh, and then, and if you find today's discussion interesting, uh, I also do on an irregular basis a podcast called the Saturday Supercast, which is me and all sorts of friends getting together to <laughs> really break down these old cartoons uh, and newer cartoons, actually. Um, to pick them apart and find out what makes them tick, what makes them interesting. So it's a lot of nerdy philosophical discussion on uh, 80s, 90s, and 2000s cartoons. Yeah, just to so, on that, uh, there's some really good yeah. good ones if you're curious about, well, where do you start? You know, you, sometimes when you face a podcast archive, it can be daunting. Uh, because, I mean, it's a lot of hours of content in there. Well, one yeah. one thing uh, I did, it is uh, I picked uh, a couple of, I, I just looked through the, uh, you know, the whole feed and uh, picked a couple of miniseries. I, I picked the, uh, uh, there was the holiday entertainment ones, and that, that were things like Santa Claus Comes to Town and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and all that kind of stuff. And then there was also um, a, a miniseries, I think it was two episodes on He-Man, right? Yes. Or, or was it just one really long episode? I forget. No, no, it was it was two very long episodes. Yeah. I think they were like two hours a piece. So there's like four hours of me and uh, Sean Robert of branded in the eighties dot com and Kevin Cross of Kevin Cross dot net, um, really yeah. picking the picking apart to the to the almost to the atomic level what makes the He Man and the Masters of the Universe cartoon tick, uh, peppered with all sorts of audio clips uh, refer that of the scenes we refer to. Um, we got a lot of great comments on those, uh, that, that two-parter, uh, to this day. And we recorded that like two years ago, yeah. but uh, I remain very proud of, of those discussions. Those are, that's a topic I'm also super, uh, nutty about is, is He-Man. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's sugarserials.com and we'll link to those episodes in the show notes. Uh, thanks for that, Rob. Oh, my pleasure. I didn't know you listened to this. I did. Yeah. They're, they're awesome. Good place to start. So when we bring up... 80s cartoons, 90s cartoons, whatever period of time you grew up in, late, late 70s cartoons. There's a lot of awesome, awesome cartoons from the late 70s, even the 60s. Um, most people have fond memories of this time. Now, when I, when I say most people, I'm, I'm not just talking about the normals. Now, I'm not talking about just the non-practitioners. I run into this with uh, people who are in the creative arts who have since moved on from watching cartoons on a regular basis for whatever reason. 
Uh, I'm not making judgments here. I'm just saying this is a fact. Most people, when you bring up that stuff, they're like, oh, Space Ghost. I love Space Ghost. And I'm not talking about Space Ghost Coast to Coast. I'm talking about the original Space Ghost cartoon or um, Thunder of the Barbarian, Dino Mutt, uh, Frankenstein Jr. and the Impossibles, right? Any of those. You have fond memories. However, every once in a while, when I'm talking with fellow adults uh, who are non-practitioners or just haven't watched this stuff in a long time, I run into uh, some friction in terms of what they remember or how they remember it. And I get this response from people. They say, you know, I watched Voltron recently. doesn't really hold up. doesn't hold up. And uh, to which I say, hold up to what? <laughs> what are you holding it up to? Um, you know, the current block you know, it, of today. Like, you know, projects that for one single thing, they... they uh, uh, I mean, it's a big piece of entertainment, but it is one project, and they, you know, maybe they spent two hundred billion. You know, it doesn't hold up to that, right? <laughs> right, and, and, and yeah, and, and I mean, granted, and, you know, you know, there's, there's, some, yeah, I, I know what you mean. I, pretty, yeah, it doesn't hold up to Michael Bay films, right? We're under, right? What's that, Rob? There's some pretty extreme constraints these cartoon projects were under by by comparison. For sure. Absolutely. And, and, but also I think in some cases, as we'll discuss in a little while here, um, those constraints are actually uh, benefits in, in a lot of different ways. But the, the, this is one of the things I run into a lot is people saying like, uh, you know, they have like a, a hazy recollection. You know, I think about Captain Caveman and I remember him screaming Captain Caveman. I remember, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Bugs Bunny voice actor, Mel Blanc. I remember him doing the voice. I remember a little bit, but I don't remember much. I remember being silly, you know, and, and therefore it doesn't match my tastes today. And you know what? That's awesome. That's fine. If you don't enjoy watching Sesame Street today as an adult, that's your prerogative. However, I think it's a little short-sighted to say it doesn't hold up because it's missing uh, kind of some critical points. Or worse, I run into this. Uh, I was at a convention. I won't say which one. Uh, several years ago, and I was tabling next to uh, another person, another artist, and I had on my table, uh, and I totally did not think this was going to happen, but I had on my table a bunch of the inked daily sketches that I do, or the warm-up sketches that I do of often cartoon characters from our youth, and I had them up for sale, and this person next to me had a whole bunch of 80s and 90s cartoon characters sketches for sale, but this person's sketches were Gargamel covered in Smurf blood. Uh, they were Smurfette, but extremely buxom and, uh, you know, very alluring. And I didn't understand what was the purpose of those sketches, but, the, you know, art, artistic expression, this person's prerogative. But the part that really kind of set me off was when people were asking about, like, why are you drawing Gargamel covered in Smurf blood? Uh, this person said, oh, those 80s cartoons, they just warped my mind, man. They warped my mind, and I'm left like this. I'm totally messed up because these 80s cartoons. And that was the part where I got irritated because I was like, what? Why? How did they mess you up? There was nothing dangerous in these shows. Uh, there was no sense of uh, uh, unmet expectations in life that were placed in before you by these 80s cartoons. They did not inadequately prepare you for adulthood. Something else messed you up, not the Smurfs, okay? I just want to say, uh, you know what? You reminded me of a moment in uh, Tyler James' workshop, um, Absolute Consents, when he was mentioning how uh, artists can, uh, can sort of draw upon pop culture to reach out to other audiences. And I would bet this could be someone that, that's just making that kind of choice to find a way to advertise and reach out. And either they're being wily and totally just trying to BS you and, and hide that, or they just, mm -hmm. they don't know. They're just like, I, I draw, you know, sexy Smurfette and people show up at my table if I, you know, and they see Gargamel and he's, he's looking like a death metal cover, then people come to my table. <laughs> It's a provocative image, yes. Exactly, and I get how to be provocative because I—that's one of my reasons why I'm doing this, man. I'm trying to entertain people. Right. No. Totally. It. Totally. And I'm not trying to defend the guy. I'm just saying, well, some, sometimes I just thought it was interesting. Um, it was a bit of an aha. You reminded me of the aha I had in Tyler's class, and I went, "Hey, wait, gotcha." Uh, Which we'll also link to in the show notes. But yeah, because that's a great workshop, great presentation that he did. Awesome presentation, actually. Um, Still, still chewing on some of the ideas he threw at us in that hour, two hours actually. Um, but, but yes, uh, I totally get that, and I'm, and I, and I don't want to mischaracterize my position by saying that that guy doesn't have a right to say those things. 
but w- uh, when th- those words are taken literally, it makes me cock my eyebrow and get get confused because I don't understand what the warping power what what the what what warping power these cartoons have, uh, especially when uh, some certain complaints are leveled at them. So let's go back to they don't hold up. Why don't they hold up? Here are five common arguments I get whenever I get on these topics, and I and I weird people out with how excited I get about this topic. Uh, is they say, oh, it doesn't hold up, and I'm like, well, what do you mean? And they say, well, the characters are too two dimensional. You know, they were they didn't feel real. They didn't they didn't have any kind of inner life. They didn't register as a real character in a real novel or a real film, whatever. Uh, or they say the storytelling was simplistic. It was hack. Uh, Snarf and the Thundercats clear vehicle meant to uh, get children to be involved in the story, and I'm the guy who always hated Snarf. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm the guy who hated the little kid character in every cartoon. And m- I, I would submit that probably most of us, when we were really little kids, probably didn't mind that character so much. It's when we turned 13. It was when I turned 13 that I started hating Spike in the Transformers cartoon. Um and later on learn to appreciate Spike again. But it's when you go through those teen years that usually you, you hate that character. But I, you're a father, Rob. I'm betting when your child watches certain shows and a character who is there clearly, you know, maybe comes across as being like, this is the vehicle character for little children. I bet if she hasn't encountered them yet, she will respond to them, right? Uh, yeah, I bet. I really, I think so. And in, in some, uh, the example that comes to mind is actually Dora the Explorer and the character uh, Swiper. Which, mm-hmm. on one hand, you think, what an ineffective bad guy, right? You, so, who's who is what is this? If you've never heard of it, I'll I'll briefly sum you know summarize. Uh, so Dora's an explorer. And she's she's busy helping people in her land and what this her her neighborhood foresty world that she lives in, and she has a friend uh, a monkey friend uh, named Boots, and they go on adventures together together and help each other out. There's a recurring bad guy kind of on the show called uh swiper and he's a fox and he's sneaky wears like a a little little robber mask and all that stuff too to emphasize Mm -hmm. and he shows up and basically to to foil him they just tell him swiper no swiping three times right and if they say it too slow sometimes he succeeds but even if he succeeds all he does is he just ditches the evidence basically he just grabs it and then chucks it and you think (laughs) first i thought oh wow he got a hold of the thing and then he just kind of blows it after that, where he it's not like he's trying to possess everything. And after a while, I actually was like, well, what's the point of that? And even almost having two reactions at the same time, like he's ineffective, I'm annoyed. and But at the same time, wow, is my child really clicking with this character where eventually um, uh, my kid is was role-playing Dora and Dora and Boots and whatnot. And then it switched, which, where I was mostly Swiper. <laughs> And I yeah. think it is because Swiper represents the uh, the urges of a toddler and the innocence of a toddler at, at the same time, where there is no long term negative intent going on. So of course, the, the, for the intended audience, Swiper's brilliant. Then I went, "Oh my god, wow! Uh, could I have written Swiper? I don't, I don't think so." You know. Well, that's just it. See, I'm, I want to pick your brain later on when we get to some later parts of this discussion uh, where you have, happen to be married to a woman who specializes in early childhood development. And a yeah. lot of my cases that I'm going to make are based upon what a child is developmentally ready for. And understanding that is a lot trickier than it seems, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, so to, to these, to these uh, complaints against these shows the, or the arguments or cases that are made before me about why they can't watch these anymore. Not that they have to, but, but you know, why they're dismissive about it. Uh, the worlds make no sense, you know. Uh, Silverhawks, we'll talk about it in a little bit. Uh, they're breathing in outer space. You can't breathe in outer space. There's no air in outer space. That doesn't make any sense. That's silly. That's hackneyed writing. It's sloppy writing uh, based on toys. These are just half-hour commercials. A lot of the stuff that came out in the 80s and even throughout the 90s, right? Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, uh, Batman the Animated Series was ba- had a, a corresponding toy line. Even today, we have uh, the Clone Wars cartoon, which is serving as a commercial for these wonderful action figures and vehicles and accessories. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, are, are these is this entertainment or are these just commercials? And then, strangely enough, another argument that gets levied at the same time 
as the, as it's just a commercial is oh it's preachy it's pro social drivel this is just this is uh Mr. Rogers kind of, and don't even get me started on people bashing Mr. Rogers but uh but you know it it's it's uh it's dumbed down and it's saccharine sweet it's uh it's cloying it's not it's not giving our children the hard facts of life right so uh you know it's like it's a commercial that tries to teach us how to be good people factory what's that i said put a screwdriver in their hand and get them to the factory and <laughs> yeah right right uh even though if you ask any parent today uh what is it important for your child to have an imagination that'll be like you bet you know but not too much <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so what I've got coming up is I have an argument, a counter argument for each of these five points that have been that I've heard uh, a multitude of times in the past. And what's really great is they serve double duty. These are not only counter arguments to defend watching and loving uh, cartoons for kids, but each one of these is a key fundamental point that are a, a, a distillation of a key writing technique and strategy that I submit would be helpful to uh, storytellers of all stripes. So the first point to answer, I, I'm answering these in order too. So when people say the characters were two dimensional, uh, I say the characters are vibrant. And uh, there's a lot of different kinds of ways to describe this vibrancy, but uh, in cartoons, uh, in, in comics too, in comics for kids, cartoons for kids, uh, the characters come across a little bit louder. Uh, it's not two dimensional as much as it is a starting point for the characters. And that starting point is loud, so you know the differences. We know, and we'll talk about this more in a second, but we know, looking at those two guys, even if we don't know anything about Transformers, we know who the good guy and bad guy is. And there's a lot going on there to deliver that information to us. So, but I want to talk about writing for a second, because I think this is a really interesting point. I've spent a lot of time studying this and thinking about it and chomping on it and kind of trying to make sense out of it. And this is as best as I can make sense out of it. So... Let's we'll do a couple case studies. Here's G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero from 1983 through 1986 or 7. Uh, you could take any of the characters in this series and boil them down to a few key words, and they never deviate from those key words. Now, is this two-dimensional, or is this vibrancy? So you take Duke, for instance, the leader of the G.I. Joe team, at least in the first season and a half. Uh, you could sum up as dedicated hero, man of action, really, really good guy. There's countless points, and that, that, that sounds really flat, right? But you can inflect this in a lot of different ways. Like, for instance, there's an episode from Season 1 or Season 2 called Cold Slither where the Dreadnoughts are uh, contracted by Cobra to uh, pretend to be a rock band and become very mega popular. <laughs> that's, that's, that's an easy feat, right? It's like, here, we'll just give you some money. You go become a mega popular band. But uh, that's kind of a funny point, but that, we'll get to like the, the logic behind that in a second. Um, and they become a popular rock band, and Cobra is putting subliminal messages in their music. So as, the more and more people listen to Cold Slither, the, 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 the more they become hypnotized, and, uh, and, and, and thereby kind of accelerating their popularity so the Cobra can broadcast their evil messages to young people, right? Playing on that, that paranoia in the 80s about subliminal messages and heavy metal music, right? Yep, I've lived through that, and that's why I'm, <clears throat> I am visibly reacting to what Jersey's describing, because I lived through that. <laughs> <clears throat> and recall uh, Geraldo Rivera's uh, 2020 special report on the evils of heavy metal. And I recall at that <laughs> age promising my mother not to listen to heavy metal. And we all know how that turned out. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him now. Look right below me, everybody. Uh, that that hair is the dead giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. It's, it's, but yes, it's clever, though, to, to actually bring that, 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 that's a very timely topic where they're bringing, weaving that into the plot of G.I. Joe, actually. Yeah, and, and it was a show of its time. I mean, there were many, many episodes that were dealing with things that people were scared about or talking about at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, when the characters, a couple Joes get hooked on Cold Slither's music and eventually become hypnotized and, like, go off to the, 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 the what is it called, the big arena where Cold Slither's playing, they go AWOL. And when Duke hears about this, he's he's ticked. You know, uh, Joe's going AWOL, what? Not on my watch. And they said, oh, well, they just went to the Cold Slither rock concert. And Duke's immediate reaction is this. Cold Slither sounds like Cobra stuff to me. And they're like, no, it's just a rock band, Duke. And he's like, oh, oh, I guess I don't really pay attention to this stuff. But what does that tell us? It's one line. One line tells us that this guy thinks about two things, being a Joe and fighting Cobras. That's the long and short of the character. Uh, but he also has a sense of humor. He has a smarminess. There's a two-parter of, of the Saturday Supercast where I spend an inordinate amount of time talking, comparing Duke to uh, the Shatner Kirk. 
Uh, oh, interesting. It, it, where the, there's a lot of similarities to that kind of like uh, smooth smarminess, but uh, ultimately, like Kirk, uh, Duke can never be involved in a relationship. He can't go any further than flirting because he's married to the G.I. Joe team. He's married to his job kind of thing. So, uh, and then, oh, there's an episode um, in one of the first, the first two miniseries actually follow kind of a, a rhythmic cycle reflecting each other where Duke gets captured in the first episode and is at Cobra headquarters for a majority of the miniseries. And every time he gets captured, they, they, they bring him out of the carrier or whatever, and he's got his arms behind his back. And the moment he can get loose, the moment he can get loose, does he run away? Does he uh, threaten? Does he try to find a place to hide? No, the first thing he does every time is just punch as many Cobras as he can. That's his first thought, is punch Cobras, punch Cobras, punch Cobras. And it always ends with a big pile of Cobras punching him. So, and you can you watch a, a whole bunch of episodes. That's the first thing he thinks about. But then there's episodes like... Um, uh, Captives of Cobra, where uh, the Cobra puts these hypnotic uh, headbands on a bunch of the Joe's family members. They they break into the Joe's data files and find out who their extended families are, kidnap them, put these hypnotic headbands on them, and basically give them guns and send them after the Joe's. The Joe's aren't going to shoot them. And uh, there's this very, very tender moment where uh, Shipwreck's nephew, who's like a 12-year-old, uh, he's, got, he's got a gun, and he's, he's pointing the gun at some highly explosive stuff. And uh, Duke's trying to reason with him, but the kid's under, uh, you know, the mind control. And in the, in the critical moment, the kid doesn't do it. The mind control is broken. And when Duke, he, he charmingly laughs to the kid as he's pulling him down off of the truck where all the explosives were. And then he pulls the headband off of the kid. And then he turns to the camera and crushes it in his hand. And he says in this just almost murderously angry voice, when I get my hands on you, Baroness, because she's the one who was doing the bad things. Uh, so he can switch from, like, this tenderness, hey, kid, don't worry, there's nothing to worry about, to... I can't wait to get my hands on these bad guys because they did a really, really terrible thing today. So again, one track guy. Uh, Alpine and Bazooka, introduced in the third G.I. Joe miniseries, uh, the, uh, uh, the Pyramid of Darkness. And Alpine is a sass mouth uh, back talker. He's always uh, complaining to the to the to his commanding officers. He doesn't want to have to go do the, the important thing that he's got to do. But he's not a cynic. He's not a cynic. He still will do it. He, he knows his commitments, but he's that doesn't stop him from grumbling about it. His best friend is Bazooka, who's a good-natured doofus. That's all you need to know about Bazooka. He's always the same guy. He's not very bright, but he's very sweet. Uh, and uh, they, they make a good team. you got the smart mouth guy with like the dumb guy who says right to everything that Alpine says. Um, Beachhead, intense, angry. Uh, but that anger and intensity comes out of the fact that, like Duke, he cares only about being a G.I. Joe. He's like Duke up to 11 without all the charm. Right? All of the focus and intensity of Duke. So to where if somebody's blowing bubbles in, uh, in, in the lineup in the morning, he's going to chew them out. And that's the scene from G.I. Joe, the movie, where he's giving Tunnel Rat a hard time for being a slacker so all these guys a uh, few words you can paint a pretty accurate picture of them and it doesn't change much over the series but what it does it gives you a distilled kind of focused essence of a character okay let's use another case in point transformers is one i can talk about for ages um and what's more is it's a widely known enough property that we are familiar enough with these characters that even if you haven't watched the cartoon in a long time we remember that Starscream is treacherous, narcissistic, and ambitious, right? That sums up pretty much all of his behaviors. They all come out of that core of these three words. Um, there's a great episode called uh, S -S oh, uh, War of the Dinobots, second Dinobot episode, first season. Uh, Mega <laughs> they, they name the defining characteristic of the three main Dinobots in that episode. Megatron sends Soundwave to scan the brains of the Dinobots to find out what their weaknesses are. And uh, we discover that, in the, these are Megatron's words, Slag is hostile, Grimlock is arrogant, and Sludge is stupid. And that's the core of those characters. Sludge always says, I follow strongest leader always. Grimlock says, Optimus Prime strong, but me Grimlock stronger. Uh, Slag says, me Slag want to fight enemies. Uh, who didn't love Grimlock? We all look back and we go, and you ask a lot of people who watch Transformers, they love Grimlock. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to know about him. Well, <laughs> this is where it gets complicated. In season one, yes, he was very arrogant. Season three, he becomes a little bit more of a lighthearted comedy goof character. That's neither here nor there. The point is, is you can take one word and describe the character. Um, 
Season two, Cliff Jumper in the episode The Traitor. Uh, he gets center stage for an episode, and they really get to explore this whole thing about how Cliff Jumper is the hot headed and, and impulsive Autobot. He catches Mirage uh, in a place where he shouldn't be without even bothering to ask, Hey, why were you in that place that you shouldn't have been? He just automatically assumes you're a Decepticon. You must be a Decepticon. You're a traitor. And the whole episode is him just constantly accusing Mirage of being a traitor and Mirage trying to clear his name. Uh, this was a different inflection on the whole idea of he's the guy who's always saying, let me at him. I'll, I'll get him. He's always jumping into the fray. The very first uh, miniseries, uh, Optimus Prime sends him on a reconnaissance mission, and the moment he gets a clear shot at Megatron, he shoots him, even though he was ordered not to fire. Uh, so he's always operating within the parameters of being hot-headed and impulsive. Um, and then we got Rumble. Uh, most of us remember Rumble, too, one of Soundwave's cassettes. Sadistic Street Punk. Talks like kind of like a sleazy John Travolta kind of guy from like the 70s. And, uh, you know, he's just he's just a mean spirited punk. He's not very bright. Um, it, notice how these th the, just throwing these three words can really paint a picture in your head very clearly. Right. You automatically assume if I say to you, guy, say to you, is this guy going to score high in his SATs? Probably not. Probably not. <clears throat> Probably not. Based on the assumptions we make, based on the, the, like those three key words I, right the sats are culturally biased against uh rumbles culture and, and outlook on things <laughs> did, I, did i catch you off guard with that one <laughs> i just imagining a fanfic where, where rumble is he's he's making a case for that he's not that bad a guy it's just that you know the 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 definitions of society are, are at odds with his uh his ideas of conformity right exactly why you keep take a punch in the face that's how that you know that's how we show we <laughs> care about each other right <laughs> where where rumble's from <laughs> Uh, so yes, this is, this is a bit simple. This is a bit, uh, you know, boiled down. Uh, but this, you could do this with cartoons of today. Now, Rob, I don't expect that you have seen My Little Pony Friendship is Magic yet. Correct. Um, not. when your daughter is of age, I highly recommend you watch it together because, uh, I think it is excellent, excellent watching for parents and children. Um, mm. but in, in the theme song, in the theme song of the show, they explain the key characteristics of each of these characters, and I jotted them down here. So in the theme song, Pinkie Pie on the upper left says, tons of fun as she's doing her thing. She's cheerful. That's all you need to know about Pinkie Pie. A beautiful heart is what Rarity says, and she's the artistic one. She's a bit of a little bit of a diva. Uh, and she, she, she's beautiful, and she knows it. She's the most beautiful pony in Ponyland, and, and she's aware of this fact. Um, Big Adventure, and that's Rainbow Dash. She's the sporty one. She's competitive. She's aggressive, and she's looking for Big Adventure. Uh, Applejack, her line in the song is faithful and strong, and that's exactly what she is. She's the hardest working pony. She's the the helpful pony. She's the uh, she's the Hufflepuff of uh, the pony. She's uh, you know stalwart and loyal. And then sharing kindness. That's what uh, uh, Fluttershy says. She's the sensitive pony. So right there in the theme song, right in the first 15 seconds of your watching experience, you're getting a sense of what to expect from all these characters. And look at the body language on all of them. Look at their faces. Look at the way the eyes are designed. It tells you that, right? So when you look at uh, Rarity, the white pony on the bottom left, uh, big glamorous eyelashes, right? Almond-shaped eyes. Compare that to Pinkie Pie's eyes up there. The big, googly, uh, you know... Uh, cheerful goofball eyes. And then look at Fluttershy's with the, like the sad slopes on them because she's sensitive and quiet. She doesn't like to talk too loud. And then look at Rainbow Dash's eyes with those eyebrows, right? Oh, yeah. So a lot going on there. So we're talking about a distillation, but we're talking about a distillation that communicates lots and lots and lots and lots, right? It's, uh, as my buddy Hoover once told me, it's, uh, it's a Slurpee without all the ice. It's just the syrup, right? Concentrated. Uh, so... This is something I've talked about in a lot of my past workshops and also in a lot of podcasts is one of the things I like to do is come up with one sentence that describes my characters. This one sentence is an anchor point. It's a grounding point. It is a, a, a fulcrum point from which all actions should come from. Uh, and, and it's a great uh, editing tool when you're writing a story, to, when you feel like maybe I'm going a little bit adrift and I'm not sure why. Let's go back to that one sentence description. Is this something this character would naturally do? Is this something that supports this one sentence about this character? This one sentence isn't at the exclusion of all other data. It's, but what it is, is it's 
uh, the starting point of all other data. Does that make sense, Rob? Yeah, it, it's meant to be evocative and the reaction to your reaction also communicates more information. So it kind of echoes something about the character, even though it's not all inclusive. Right. So let me, I, I use this as a case in point here is Skybite, one of my favorite cartoon characters of all time from Transformers Robots in Disguise 2001 is when that series came out. And I'll just tell you a little bit about Skybite and then we could read the one sentence description. Skybite is the second in command of the Predacons, the bad guys in the series. Um, he fancies himself a poet. He likes to compose poetry on the battlefield. So when he feels that he's on the, on the cusp of victory, he'll compose a new haiku for the moment. Uh, he is constantly frustrated with his underlings, who are three kind of street punk kind of characters who are always giving him sass back. Uh, he gl glorifies his leader. He's the, he's the antithesis of Starscream. He, instead of wanting to take the leader's job, he wants to do it all to for the glory of the wonderful Megatron. He loves the guy. Uh, and, and yet his achievements are never acknowledged by Megatron. Megatron is always berating him, always giving him a hard time, slapping him upside the head. Like you fool, you're, you know, you're sentenced to do this, this really menial task because you failed today. And then Skybite sulks out of the room, you know, and then he gets, then when he's off doing his punishment, his, his underlings are giving him a hard time. Um, Every plan he tries to uh, engage in always blows up in his face. And I got some examples here of here he is with a bunch of bandages on as he's reading uh, uh, Earth literature to try to understand humans because they just perplex him. You know, he's reading to be or not to be. Make up your mind. Uh, and there's another episode in the middle uh, image where uh, he's trying to convince the Autobots to attack some of the other bad guys. Uh, to So they'll fail, thereby elevating his position in the rank. So if these other guys fail, then I'll look that much better to Megatron. But in the, uh, in, in, in the Autobots say, well, we'll only go do this thing if you perform some seal tricks. And so then he humiliates himself by balancing a ball on his nose and contorting himself in all sorts of different ways. Uh, and then the third image is he's... Uh, trying to pretend to be an Autobot to, uh, to attack some of the other bad guys. Again, the same kind of ideas. If I humiliate them in the name of the Autobots, then I'll look that much better to Megatron. He'll send me on more missions. And his costume was made of paper mache, and it starts on fire, and the plan blows up in his face. Oh, so, okay. so Neil Kaplan, one of the voice actors on the series, was interviewed about the series, and he described Skybite in these words. He said, he's a Shakespearean actor who is forced to play second banana. And I thought, what a perfect description, because you think of the dignity of a Patrick Stewart, of a, um, oh, I don't know, a Kenneth Branagh, but he, he's, he's, he's trying to have that dignity, but he's constantly getting slapped upside the head like, like Larry and Curly of the Three Stooges, right? Mm. Yeah, Lawrence Fishburne, so, too. There you go. Lawrence Fishburne, great example. Yeah, Lawrence Fishburne, like if he was in the Three Stooges. <laughs> <laughs> right so there he is being uh what was his name in the matrix uh morpheus morpheus yeah so imagine morpheus walks into the room but he's got mo there slapping him upside the head and he's taking it right that's skybite in a nutshell mm. so one sentence one simple idea tells it all so this isn't two-dimensionality as such it is it's consistency and it's distilled but and there's some problems that come out of that too, which we'll address. Uh, but anybody who uh, ever read the file cards in the backs of these action figures when they were kids uh, and were excited to wonder, uh, I think this was part of the reason that the Transformers franchise was so successful. It wasn't just the playability factor of the toys. It was on the back was this exciting card that gave you a one paragraph description of what this guy's about. And here's Cliff Jumper. His function, warrior. Awesome. So now I know that he has a specific function in the organization. And it's got a little slogan from him, a little uh, motto. And strike first, strike fast, strike hard. What did I say about Cliff Jumper earlier? He was the impulsive and aggressive one, right? And then there's a few stats there that you can look at too. But again, this is giving you in a single image, in a paragraph, everything you really ultimately need to know about the character, although we can go in different places. Um, but somebody's going to say, aha! This means your characters can't grow or deal with sophisticated issues, right? Because if, if you could summarize them in such a distilled way, that means there's no room for growth. You put them back in the acorn, and they can't be a tree. And then I put an example here that refutes that. And I'm wondering if you could talk about this, Rob, because I know you've watched Avatar The Last Airbender. Ah, uh, Zuko. 
<clears throat> one of my biggest weaknesses, uh, or I, 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 something that I love in stories is when you have this, uh, I mean, a character who has a, a worldview you disagree with in the beginning, but maybe has some interesting aspects to them and you know something like um being really proficient at martial arts and having cool fire powers and whatnot and and sometimes even being surrounded by another character like um like zuko's uncle um where his uncle has he's a far more sympathetic person than than zuko is especially at first and then to see uh when you have someone who has that that different outlook, then you start maybe being presented with the opportunities to wonder why, why do they see things that way? And all of a sudden their outlook starts to become more nuanced and that nuance can lead to change even. Where you, you have a, a greater, or getting sympathy where you really expect and want something else from that character, but then have a new tension because you wish something better for them, but they, they keep making choices that <clears throat> make you mad. They did a wonderful thing with Zuko in season or the book two. It's not season two. It's book two of the first avatar series where it looks like he's going to go on the straight and narrow uh, to, to bring people up to speed who haven't watched the series. And this is not spoiling anything. Okay. So Zuko is a firebender. Uh, he was the only son of, uh, Fire Lord Ozai, I think is his name. I think that's right. uh, and, and he's been banished. As we can see on the screen, he has a burn on his face. He's got this burn scar. Uh, this burn scar was given to him by his father when he was exiled. He's been exiled, and uh, he feels that the only way to reclaim his honor is to capture the Avatar, Aang. Um, so from the start, we see that he is an aggressive character. He's a disciplined character, a little bit hot-tempered character. Uh, but that hot temper comes out of the fact that he is desperate to reclaim his honor. This isn't about being evil. He's not a fist-shaking bad guy who twirls his mustache and ties women to train tracks. This is a guy who is, a part of him is missing, and he wants it back. He wants his honor back. Sure. Book two, uh, he's exiled with his, or he's almost captured by some people, and then he runs away with his uncle, and they kind of go undercover, and they're living in, I think, the Earth Kingdom, yes? Yes. Uh, if I remember right. And it seems like he's gonna he's gonna go straight. He's gonna get Zuko's on the mend. He's gonna realize that that his honor was never lost, and he just needs to accept that. And then that moment happens at the end of season two. I you know the moment I'm talking about. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, I just I, yeah, I'm surprised. Yeah, it, it's really it's intense, and uh, yeah, it's frustrating. <clears throat> because uh, I mean Zuko's scars run deep. Yeah, and you very want, much so. You want to feel like that he's going to heal, and um, he's got more work to do, basically. When he's in the when he's in the Earth Kingdom, they they did a nice job of introducing a lot of moments to show that he is a compassionate person. He is ultimately a really good guy, um, but he's just got this whole issue. He's got this whole daddy issue with his honor and his dad kicking him out of the house, uh, and that's what c compels him to do things that he knows are not a good idea. Um, and so when he does that bad thing uh, towards the end of book two, uh, it's heartbreaking for us as the viewers who really want this guy to heal. Uh, it's heartbreaking for him and the people who had trusted him. Uh, and then it sends him down even deeper than he was in book one. So when we kick off book three, he's in a much, much worse place than he ever was before, which makes his redemption towards the end that much more delicious, right? Uh, that that redeeming moment towards the end. And, come on, folks. It's it's a it's a uh, self-contained series. You know that most of the people are going to come out okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I'm I'm not spoiling anything. It's got an it's got an overly it, it's got an overall very uh, happy tone to it. So you know it's going to be a really good adventure. It turns out being more intense than I bet you would you would assume when you see the first part of it. Because what's interesting, I think Avatar plays yeah. off of our familiarity with. Uh, uh, children's entertainment and, yep. and it purposefully twists our expectations based on that uh, because there, it's there, out so sweet so saccharine and so like oh that's cute but oh my god that's even more cute okay gosh it's so much cute I'm full please you know it's very yeah. cute <laughs> and then we get to Appa's Lost Days remember that episode oh yeah 
Yeah. We, Ann and I almost couldn't make it through it. We almost had to shut it off because it was just too emotionally uh, difficult to watch that. Um, it, it was like it was like Toy Story 3 difficult, like the end of Toy Story 3 kind of. Um, yep. It's, it, but, uh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no. Uh, well, I mean, so we're singing the praise of, of, uh, an incredible, a brilliant series and, uh, yeah. and looking at how, uh, it, it played with those expectations, but I don't think it, how it became, uh, how it played with that formula. I don't think it tried to be, um, somehow what we often ascribe to adult. I think it was just a good story. And it was a good yeah. story that had left out of it certain things that can happen in life that you may more likely deal with as an adult. And it and it said, well, life is interesting even without those aspects. We can focus on this other thing and have a wider audience uh, because anyway, it's a it's a it's a exactly it's a moving. Trail. No, you 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 lead me right to this point. Is like we're looking at this picture of Zuko, and there's the quote, "Where is my mother?" Um, at a certain point in the series. It's intimated, it's not shown, but it's heavily intimated that something really terrible happened to his mother, possibly at the hands of his father. We don't know for sure. Right. We, it, it, and even in the new series, which just started, the question was raised, whatever happened to Zuko's mother? And, you know, and, and uh, somebody says, like, it's an amazing story. And then she gets interrupted. Did I just spoil it? You haven't seen it yet. Oh, no. I, I saw a commercial for it, and I'm just like, just with the design of the characters and the brief couple of lines that Cora said, I'm like, holy moly, I got to learn what happens to that character. It's, it's as good as the original. It's, it's an amazing, I've only seen the first two episodes. That's all that's been out so far, but it's, oh, it's so good. Um, breathless. I was almost breathless after watching it. So good. But um, I got to learn, more which we talk about that. Like what, what that's an interesting what? thing as far as thinking about the people who make this kind of entertainment and then the people who are doing it at, at that master level and and what kind of happens on those on those teams where they were they're able to execute to to that extent um, well i mean this all this stuff about getting down to the character's essence and distilling them down to a one sentence thing it, it jives with what i've heard uh, as as a key idea at places like pixar where they say story is king what is the story what is the big idea what is the general thing we're trying to get to here uh, and if it doesn't have a track into that that point, throw it out. It doesn't belong in there. Um, but to, to to wrap up this idea about like you know to somebody who says like oh well if you distill them down to a sentence they can't grow they're not they can't do sophisticated things. Here's Zuko, who does some very who goes through some real human pain like real human pain that I as a viewer and this isn't I I don't know I cry when I watch He-Man episodes but more than idiots like me have watched this show and have agreed that the part where Zuko does that thing in, in book two it was an emotionally difficult scene to watch why how, how why did that make people connect with it so much because he was exploring sophisticated issues but there's a different way to do it so like when we get at this whole idea of where's his mother what happened to his mother uh, that's a dark part of the story but it doesn't go into dark areas that are would be difficult for a kid to understand. So when you say, where's mommy? A kid can get that. But we as adults have a deeper appreciation for what's really being intimated there, right? So yes, you can do sophisticated things. You can have characters grow. You can have characters follow immense arcs. And Zuko grows a lot as a character, but ultimately does not deviate from that central thesis of his character, which is honor. That's the word for Zuko. And he explores multiple different ways, different inflections of the word honor. But honor is the one word you got to throw over top of his head. Either he's trying to get it or he's got it. But none of his actions deviate from that word, right? Always working hard for it. So, okay. So we talk about, you know, the, the, character, the character's vibrancy. Let's talk about the visual vibrancy, okay? And again, I'm going to talk about these designs from Transformers animated from a few years back. Uh, but before I go into that, I think it's really important that we, this is something I brought up on the show before, or maybe this was in one of my classes. <laughs> They're all blurring together now, Rob. Both. <laughs> okay. I think this slide so is one of the earlier, one of the earliest lean into art episodes, but it's a good slide. It's good, good, good to visit. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this is, this is not the only tools in cartooning. This is, again, talking about distillation. I've distilled it down to four areas, general areas of concern, right? That we can all agree upon. 
uh, shape, size, line, and color. So sh shapes make our minds think of different things, whether it's a triangle pointing down or pointing up, they feel differently. Uh, a square feels different than a circle. Like if I say it's square and circle, which one would you make a robot out of? Most people as a knee jerk reaction are gonna say square. Why? It's an inorganic shape. Circle looks more organic. Although a circle could make an equally awesome robot. But I'm just saying in a general sense, we react to things, shapes in certain ways. Uh, size, you know, something bigger has more emphasis, something smaller has less emphasis. Line, smooth line equals calm, wiggly line equals active. Uh, and then color, we have warm colors, cool colors, and then desaturated colors. Those all feel differently. So warm colors feel warmer, feel agitated, feel hot, feel angry. Cooler colors feel more aloof, withdrawn, calm. Uh, desaturated colors feel uh, uh, sometimes a little bit l more lifeless, less uh, vibrant, right? Uh, those are just some general, well, I don't want to say stereotypes, but um, well, they're, they're generalization. Yeah, aspects of design also. I mean, it's... Uh... Yeah. Yep. Oh, this was in our design series. I talked about this, didn't I? Uh, yeah, it could have been. Yep, it, it's uh, elements of design. We definitely tackled this. Um yeah. Could have been the slide too. So bearing that in mind, now let's look at these two guys. And I I use this example in my classrooms all the time. And kids and adults across the board get this. Who's the bad guy? It's the guy on the right. It's Starscream. Why? And I ask the students, they say, well, because he's pointy. He's got all these points all over him. And if you look, sure enough, his fingers are pointy. His wings are pointy. Uh, the guns on his arms are pointy. Even his feet are pointy. Look at that. There's points all over the guy. He is nothing but bristling points. He is not huggable. Optimus, on the other hand, is boxes and curves, right? Uh, look at look at the, all the swooping lines on him to indicate curvature, but then also strength with all those boxes. Uh, color. Optimus is red, white, and blue. Oh, say, can you see? Starscream is purples and grays and blacks. Uh, and then there's body language. The pose says it all. Chest out. I'm ready to protect. Starscream saying, I wonder what kind of terrible things I'm going to get to do today. So... All of that information is being communicated instantly just with the vibrant, simple designs that are used a lot in cartoons. And I, and I suspect that this is why a lot of the comics that are getting a lot of mainstream acclaim, and I say mainstream, I mean like in the trade publishing world, like Scholastic, Hyperion, Hyper, HarperCollins, Penguin, uh, they tend to have simpler art styles. And I think it's because, well, and comic strips often have simpler art styles. And I think it's because the general public gets this really easily. Um, and it could be some cloudy and way of looking at things too, where the more the more iconically a character is designed, the less explicit and prescribed the emotion is. Mm -hmm. So if you see Optimus Prime with a gristled beard and a wrinkly face and a you know, that that yeah. that's a different thing. If it you know looks like he's gonna pound some coffee and get back to hacking away on a novel or something. Versus the the iconic you know heroic uh, wow I mean he he looks I mean if if he were human he'd probably a good looking dude and and I mean, but yeah. it doesn't really he doesn't really have enough features to to say well he's kind of humanoid but any you know there's there's right. those, that space there to inject my own ideas and uh, it gets yeah it gets you involved and I forget the term McLeod used but the masking technique is what McLeod talks about ah um. Yeah, uh, the, the 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 principle that he calls the masking technique is is that when you look at a a, a outlet on the wall like a electrical socket, we see a face. Mm -hmm. You see Mickey. Uh, you see three quarters like uh, in a triangular configuration. You see Mickey Mouse. Yep. Uh, we're yes. conditioned to look for faces, right? Yep. And so the the more abstracted it is, uh, to a point, the more we identify with it and, and, and infuse ourselves into it, uh, and the more uh, distinct it becomes from us, the more it becomes other. And you'll see this happening in a lot of manga. He, he points out, like, let's say I pick up a sword and it's drawn very cartoony and I'm swinging it around. It's like it's imbued with my life essence. But then if I notice something interesting on the hilt, it'll suddenly become very de detailed and it'll have like a sense of otherness from me. So, yeah, uh, that's in Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. Uh, we'll link to it in the show notes if you haven't purchased it yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, and you know, this goes for uh, other cartoons as well. And any cartoon you can probably do this with is that you can tell who the good guy is and the bad guy is. And here's another cartoon that you probably haven't seen yet, Rob, but I'm, I'm sure you will soon. Uh, this is from uh, Phineas and Ferb. It's Professor Doofenshmirtz and uh, Perry the Platypus. And actually, I think you could probably start watching it with your daughter now. <laughs> it's it's pretty bold and vibrant, and uh, it's it's 
wildly funny, but uh, nothing in there could be, in my mind, uh, thought of as harmful to children. Okay. But, but look at Doofenshmirtz's head. Triangle, right? Uh, Perry the Platypus is uh, a rectangle. He's sort of like a big old uh, hot dog, almost, right? Yeah. Strength, stability, uh, whereas Doofenshmirtz is, it has a uh, less balanced pose and messy hair and so on. So uh, you can do this with any characters. Take two characters from any series. But So we're talking about simplicity. Simplicity is different than simplistic, okay? And I want to make this distinction. And ultimately, we're not even really talking about simplicity. Uh, but to, just to define it real quick, sim simple means easy to understand, not complicated. It doesn't mean bad. Simple, <laughs> anybody who's ever looked at a well-designed website, right? Oh, Back me up on this, Rob. This is something you, you UI designers are focused on a lot. It, simplicity is difficult. Um, picking the right information to set aside and de and, and or de-emphasize is a uh, it's a difficult process. Uh, another word for that would be uh, elegant. Elegance, yes. So yes, when we talk about simplicity, we're talking about elegance. One line serving the purpose of six things. Um, one swipe on the screen, you know, and knowing how to do it. Right. Um, versus simplistic means that that's like saying like uh uh oh oh this 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 job situation uh we need somebody to get in there and fix it <laughs> right it's like it's like somebody just needs to get in there and fix it for crying out loud or somebody needs to get these foreigners out of the country to, to, to uh, solve all of our unemployment problems hmm? you know stop stop buying or buy more american and then we'll just have more jobs you know uh, that that i'm not making a political statement here what i'm saying is that is a very simplistic way of looking at it because it's much more complex than that mm -hmm. um that may be part of the problem but it's part it's not all so Difference between simple and simplistic, and then, but ultimately, what we're really working towards here with these kinds of stories and this kind of storytelling is clarity. Clarity uh, over simplicity or or elegance is that uh, you know freedom from ambiguity. You know what it means when you look at it. You're not going, hmm, who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Ambiguity is great. I have talked extensively about how I look for uh, ways to introduce ambiguity onto my pages so that they can be read in a variety of ways and equal. Uh, both ways are valid. I love that stuff. But ambiguity in kids, to expect ambiguity in kids' cartoons is, I think, kind of missing the point. Ambiguity is great in an indie film. It's great in uh, uh, a sophisticated novel for adults, right? Sure. Uh, to invite the readers to wonder, right? You can have curated ambiguity, too, where there's there's maybe multiple paths through an experience where it's you're, you're assured a good outcome. So... An amusement park isn't just one line of rides that you always go on one, then the other, then the other, then the other, then your exit. Um, you Different things happen at different times. There are different paths and all that stuff. Uh, but but at the same time, it, it is a curated experience that can have uh, clarity and be easy to, to understand. Right. Yes. Yeah. You can have. Yes. Absolutely. And I. I think this ties into our design talks as well as uh you know talks that you've done on uh user experience uh or storytelling to make your comics UI awesome is that um ambiguity works best when there's clarity too. Right. So like just this morning I had to go to Lowe's to return something. I had to go return an item that I bought that was the wrong one and ugh. but uh, I walk in the door and. Uh, there's the there's the um, uh, the returns counter like right there by the entrance and I was like wow I was I was for a moment I was really impressed with Lowe's I said you guys thought about my experience so much to where if I just want to get in and get out I want to return and just go I can just do that I don't have to I thought for sure I was gonna have to navigate way to the back of the store and ask a dude where do I return this but there it was big bold letters returns so I go up I return my thing and I, and I feel like oh I'm out of here I turn around to go back out that door. Ex or uh, entrance only. Now you got to walk all the way through the store to get out again. In other words, now that you got money in your pocket, time for you to walk by all these exciting uh, different drills and hammers and saws and everything. Did you say you were at Lowe's uh, or a casino? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like I said, like for just a moment, I was really impressed. I thought like, wow, you're really thinking about making me happy by having me just have an easy in and out to get my my experience done with mm -hmm. but instead no i was wrong it's easy to get in but hard to get out and that wasn't immediately apparent to me i had to stand there in front of the doors for a, a couple seconds going why isn't it opening and then i realized oh there's a big sign there that says exit only Should that wasn't use, immediately apparent use the implements what? available at lowe's to macgyver a way out of that door just like start <laughs> taping some implements together and like 
well, I've got to make it shiny and large enough, and it's got to attract some heat, and it's got to move. And then you're just kind of operating it as a puppet master from the inside. Until all of a sudden, and then I got to tell I got to tell uh, an anecdote about something my uncle once told me that is uh, kind of homespun wisdom that that uh, uh, sort of reinforces this whole idea of the thing I'm building. <laughs> my guy always says, "My old uncle, blah blah blah, once said, uh, you, you can't make a horseshoe without killing a few bears or something.'" And then he throws the dart that's made out of bamboo filled with gunpowder or whatever. Um, <laughs> and then he exits Lowe's. <laughs> and then he exits. <laughs> oh, MacGyver, where were you? Uh, but but anyway, so I just wanted to make this point. I think it's an important point is that when we're talking about this stuff, we're talking about clarity. Uh, a story that I've told before that I got from Dan Mishkin, and I'm going to talk about him again in a second, is um, – Ernie Cologne, who did the graphic novel adaptation of the 9-11 Commission report, was interviewed in NPR, and, they, and the 9-11 Commission report was this huge, huge uh, tome of text, 500, 600, 700 pages of text. And he turned it into a couple hundred pages of graphic novel, and the interviewer said, gee, did you find it hard to simplify all those ideas down into images? And he said, no, 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 a cartoonist doesn't simplify, they clarify. Uh, so this one sentence kind of approach to looking at characters is a clarification of the character. It is not writing them off as being a two-dimensional cutout. There is room for them to grow. There's room for them to go different places. And there's all sorts of different ways to in investigate how Duke is a really, really good guy who thinks about nothing except stopping Cobra. You can go a lot of places with that. It doesn't limit you. Uh, and as a matter of fact, something we've talked about in the show and in other places is limitations make creativity they don't stifle creativity so definitely okay i wanted to just hold on this slide for a moment <laughs> so um <clears throat> this is coming back to your wife rob this is coming back to kate's uh realm of expertise is in my mind if somebody says these stories, these cartoon stories are hack, they're stupid, they're no good because uh, they are written in a simple or clarified style, uh, and when you say it doesn't hold up, hold up as opposed to what? If you're saying it's stupid, when that the, or if you're saying these cartoons are stupid, then are we, are you, uh, and, and I hope this isn't a straw man argument, I hope this isn't a... Uh, uh, an ad hominem argument. Hmm. Uh, is that what it's called? An ho ad hominem? I think that's it, yeah. Um, um for straw man. but but is that suggesting that children are stupid for liking this stuff when they really should be reading 1984 by george orwell uh is, is that what we're saying uh i think it this kind of this application of this uh stupid dumb down kitty stuff argument uh misses the point because the reason that this stuff is so vibrant, the reason this stuff is so clarified, is because <laughs> this deals with the, the child's developmental level. Mm -hmm. Try to explain totalitarianism to an eight-year-old. <laughs> and you're going to have to use clarified words, right? Uh, well, certainly. And, and uh, let's, let's see. Explain. Kid I would love to see an eight-year-old uh, who really understood the horror of Big Brother's face on that screen, watching that movie, right? Oh, sure. And I actually I would, yeah. I mean, maybe maybe a precocious, very precocious eight year old would would get that to some extent, as far as the you know, like a very mm, a, a, a a creepy authoritarian dynamic, understanding like when you have a lot of choice taken away, this is this is bad, right. frustrating, and that that's like a bad guy. That's that's not the that's not a thing you want. But um, yeah, I'm definitely not an expert. I'm not my wife. I don't have her her degree in in the, in the topic and all that and her experience. But I do. Well, dude, go get her. Do, uh, <laughs> ask her a lot. I'm kidding. And whatnot. And uh, and and in you know participating in in raising a child, um, it's. Uh, yeah, I mean they're putting together the vo their vocabulary and their experience for framing and understanding these these kinds of um, ideas. So reaching out to them in ways that is, well, clear and good communication. Honestly, that's, I don't see how that's even an age targeted thing. Like good communication, having a message and conveying it well. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that works for all ages, but, um, which is one of the reasons why I think adults can really get into, you know, the more iconic forms of entertainment as well. 
if, if they're open to that and haven't assigned a um, somehow like a negative connotation to, well, that's for kids. And I'm not into that because I've transitioned from that thing in, in which, you know, and trying to draw some, some self-defining whatever from that. But as far as, uh, let's see, describing negative things, it, uh, or tough things in the world, tough ideas. Yeah. It really helps to, 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 you know, approach, approach it in a, in a uh, uh, a storytelling manner. A lot of, I mean, heck, in children's books that, that I'll, I'll read to my daughter will have, will have things in it, like a, a character getting imprisoned in a, uh, uh, a tower of a, of a castle or whatnot. Being imprisoned sucks. And it's not cool to be, to be, to be uh, like taken against your will and put somewhere. That's, that's pretty horrific. And there's stories that, that deal with that in a variety of ways, but obviously mm-hmm. things that are more, um, like a, like a Dora situation where she gets in, you know, locked in the castle cause this witch, um, well, actually it's not her. It's some other character that looks a lot like Dora. Anyway, um, those, uh, I guess they're, I don't want to make them diminutive. I don't want to say like, oh, you're using a simplified thing to talk to people who need simpler messages because again, the message has a lot of depth to it, but I but guess, the tool set is different, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's you're trying to find that common language where you can convey that. Where right, like yeah, where I'm going with this is is that what is the age when you tell your child about the Holocaust, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not trying to be glib when I say this. I'm saying seriously because I don't have children, so I haven't had to think about this question. But what is the age when they will understand it and when they will be able to deal with it? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and probably every parent's answer is going to be different. But it's a thing that happened. It was a terrible thing. And how what how do you judge when it's what what is the right way and when is the right time to deliver that information? Right. So what I'm what I'm really trying to do here is I'm not trying to turn this into an either or thing. What I'm trying to say is is that these 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 five points that I'm trying to outline here are tools that. I've I've detected in my explorations of cartoons that work for a very specific audience, but I think that you can back out and say, one sentence description, I can get a starting point to do my you know Murakami esque novel, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, right. So anyway, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna re- go a little bit more into this point in a second. Well, uh, I mean, this whole comparison. To bring a bring a comparison. Um, I was recently re going through the audiobooks. Um, what uh, Pan, Pandora's Star and Judas Unchained, Unchained by Peter F. Hamilton, and they're they are epic space opera st- stuff with like a lot of characters. But one of the things that helps you keep track of it is the tight characterization, and the the characters have a distinct voice, even though I mean they're kind of numerous, <laughs> to be honest, it, between those, those two books. Uh, but yeah, without a doubt, I would imagine, um, Peter F. Hamilton has some kind of clear, super crystallized idea of the driving force behind each of them. Right. It's funny that you talk about there being a lot of characters, uh, cause that it's, it's almost as if you detected the time for the segue to t- point two, argument two, clear storytelling. And I'm going to, I'm going to go through this one fast. Mm. Um, this is one where I would just recommend you just go watch a bunch of shows and look at how clear the storytelling is. Uh, actually, I'm going to do a quick walkthrough of a show in a second. Uh, but in a lot of the cases of these cartoons, you had 22 minutes, these days even less. You had commercial breaks in there, all right? So your story's getting interrupted at least twice, these days three or four times. Um, and a lot of these shows had a ton of characters, which means you are in a situation where economy of storytelling is crucial. You have to get as much as you can out of as little space as possible. And I've talked about this a bunch of times before. Here's an example I've used a bunch of times before, a comic that I did with Mark Rudolph of markrudolph.com called Switch Runners. It'll be in the show notes, um, where we did a 16-page story that summarized what we were trying to achieve was the same kind of amount of data that'd be in a 22-minute cartoon in 16 comics pages, which was a lot harder than it seems. Um, and, and we had a big cast, you know, 10, 11 characters that nobody's ever heard of before. We got to introduce the characters, introduce the tension, resolve the tension, and, you know, walk away feeling like we had an adventure and we got to know some people in 16 pages, right? It was a big challenge. Oh, yeah. um, so case in point, I'm going to just pick it. I picked a, a cartoon uh, out of a hat 
and said, okay, I'm going to summarize this, this episode. This was 22 minutes now, and we're going to see how much information they fit into here. And actually, you can find this on YouTube. It's the burden hardest to bear. It's the final episode of the original Transformers series before they went into what's considered season four, which is only a three or four part episode, five part or called, um, headmasters, I think. Uh, but this is the final episode with Rodimus Prime as the leader of the Autobots. And it's one of my favorite episodes. Uh, and I can walk, I can read you through this with my eyes closed because I remember it so vividly. So, okay, it starts out in Japan. Uh, Autobots are defending Japan against Decepticons. Just starts out with just fighting. Like, uh, it starts out with a, a tranquil scene of water, and all of a sudden a boat gets capsized, and there's Decepticons in the water, and Autobots are trying to protect the people. Uh, the Autobots drive off the Decepticons. Rodimus Prime's like, whoo, thank goodness, everybody's safe. And uh, a bunch of Japanese officials come up and they're saying, hey, you guys are bad for business. Every time you giant robots are around, property gets damaged, tourists go away. We're sick and tired of you Transformers messing up our world. And Optimus is trying to be diplomatic, and he's like, hey, come on, you guys. And they're just yelling, yelling at him. And finally, he even just says, like, why don't you just defend yourself then? You know, if you don't want us here, maybe I could just go and the Decepticons can just do whatever they want. What would you like that? You know, he's losing his temper. Uh, so he decides he, he's going to blow off steam. He decides to go uh, joyriding because he was, after all, before he became Broadmus Prime, he was Hot Rod. He was a younger... He, he, he's not ready for the job. He's still a young man, so to speak. So he decides to do some fast driving in the mountains. And uh, while he's driving, two Decepticon cars come upon him, dead end, wild rider, and they fight with him. And uh, he goes off a cliff and crashes, gets knocked unconscious, and out pops from his chest the Matrix of Leadership, this, this sort of... Uh, this vessel, this holy relic of the Autobot race or whatever. Um, and there's a big story behind the Matrix. All you need to know is it's a very, very powerful thing. And the leader is the guardian of the Matrix. So Wild Rider gets the Matrix, and he takes it to Galvatron, the leader of the Decepticons at this time. And Galvatron's all excited. Oh, boy, I got the Matrix. I got the key to the Autobot's power. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use it against him. And he puts the... the oops, sorry. I'm hitting my microphone. Puts the Matrix in his gun and decides to fire off a shot to like show wh wh how you know how awesome it's going to be that he's going to take down all the Autobots with their own Matrix. And out from his gun come all the ghosts of the fallen Autobot leaders, and they're haunting him. They're saying, "Return the Matrix! Return the Matrix!" And he says, "Oh gosh, this is scary. Uh, all right, I'll return it. I'll return it." And so he, it, Galvatron can't do his own deeds. Uh, that's what underlings are for. So he throws the Matrix to Scourge, one of his underlings, and says, "Take this and destroy it." And Scourge mutters as he holds the Matrix in his hands. The Matrix is the key to the universe. And Galvatron says, what'd you say? Oh, oh nothing, nothing. And he says, then get rid of it. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> so Scourge, yeah, yeah nothing. Just, just like a very profound thought. Uh, Scourge goes off, shuffles off by himself, and he says, oh, they don't understand. The Matrix isn't a weapon. It's power. It's pure power. And so he puts it inside himself. See, Galvatron put it in his gun. Scourge puts it in his chest like an Autobot does. And it mutates him. All of a sudden, he get, he grows all big, gets all bumpy, and, and he says, oh my gosh, I have the power of 100 Decepticons. No, 100,000! You know, the Matrix is inside of me. Meanwhile, back at Autobot base, Rodimus wakes up, but he's no longer Rodimus. He's back to being Hot Rod because he lost the Matrix. And the, and the, the uh, Ultra Magnus and Cup and Springer are standing around saying, like, oh, are you ready to go after him? You gotta go find the Decepticons, get the Matrix back. And Hot Rod has his midlife crisis and says, hey, come on, what's the rush? You know, we've been fighting this war for millennia, and I don't see it changing. Do you? You want the Matrix? Swell, go get it. But find some other sucker to carry it because I quit. And he transforms and takes off, uh, leaving all his friends high and dry. Uh, meanwhile, Scourge now leads the Decepticon. Scourge uh, apparently kills Galvatron and Cyclonus, throws him, you know, throws him off a cliff. Uh, and says, now I'm in charge. All you Decepticons, follow me to Earth, and we're going to destroy the Autobots because I've got all their power. And so they head to, uh, of all places, Japan. Uh, I guess it's convenient because we only have 22 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in another part of Japan, uh, as Hot Rod has been off on his own, uh, you know, feeling sorry for himself, he, uh, for some reason, winds up landing in a dojo. And there are some samurai, or rather uh, martial artists, uh, doing sparring practice. And the master fights this, uh, or spars with this young student. And, uh, you know, he beats him. And he asks the student, uh, what were you thinking? And he says, oh, to be as forceful as possible. Why? Uh, because I thought I was not aggressive enough. And the, the master says, rid yourself of thinking. Don't expect to win. Don't expect to lose. Oh, but sensei, what should I expect? Expect nothing. He says, nothing? He says, nothing. And the student goes away, and there's Hot Rod sitting there thinking about what he just heard. And the sensei approaches him and says, you know, like, what's going on? What's the problem? And 
Hot Rod says, like, I don't understand. How can you uh, expect nothing? How can you achieve anything without expectation? And then Master says, one cannot think of victory without also thinking of its opposite, defeat. And thinking of defeat uh, distracts the mind from what must be done in order to win. And what must be done? Well, whatever destiny obliges one to do, one's burden hardest to bear. Uh, and Hot Rod says, thank you, Sensei. You've given me a lot to think about. He realizes what he's got to do. Meanwhile, back in the streets of Japan, uh, Scourge is chasing down a couple of poor humans. And he, he's got all this power and he's going after humans. What a jerk, right? What a sleaze ball that he's going to go after. It's like, it's like you got a bazooka. It's like, I'm going to go kill rats, right? Uh, Hot Rod shows up, hits him, you know, knocks him down, fights him, and gets the Matrix back. Uh, and puts the Matrix aside and turns back into Rodimus and says, how about a lift home, folks? Takes the Japanese folks back to their homes. And as soon as Rodimus is gone, Galvatron comes back. And he wasn't killed after all. And now Scourge, without all of his power, has to face the wrath of his leader. And uh, the final line of the episode is uh, Rodimus shows up where all the Autobots have been getting their butts kicked by all of the Decepticons since he left them high and dry. And, uh, you know, they say, oh, Hot Rod, oh, Rodimus. And uh, Cup says, son of a gun, you found that missing part, huh? And Rodimus says, not just the Matrix, Cup, a missing part of myself. And he says, that's the point, son. No matter who carries the Matrix, that's the part you never lose. And that's the part where I always cry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was quite a few minutes just for me to summarize, right? And to hit the key points. And I didn't cover everything that happened in there. And that was 22 minutes, right? Yeah. So... You're talking about really tightly packed storytelling, right? I'll give you a chance to respond, Rob. I just talked for like three minutes solid. No, it is. That's it. It's a lot of ground. It's a lot of ground to cover. Um, even let's see. That would be a, a thirty-page comic easily, if not forty. Oh yeah, what's it's the pacing is what's so what's so interesting and challenging. It it's um. It's definitely it's like when you when you unpack something that was incredibly well packed and and or maybe yeah. well packed but not not designed to be repacked and so you get it all out <laughs> how in the heck am I going to get this back in the box because it's not exactly what I want or what have you right that the, the that's a great uh, metaphor for that cartoon but it's uh, unpacking it it's uh, it almost seems like how did they fit it all into that into that time frame. So yeah, I think it does really emphasize the point of the efficiency of the storytelling. So they're probably doing a lot of, a lot of what you're describing in words was probably just de depicted. Yeah, then, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I did cover a few key dialogue exchanges, but for the yeah. most part, yeah, like I was describing stuff in a sentence that really took like three minutes to show. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a terrific metaphor is think about when, whenever I go on a trip and the last day in the hotel, I got to put the stuff back in the suitcase uh, I'm always walking out with that, that hotel bag, you know, like the plastic bag full of extra stuff that, how did I get this in here in the first place? Right. So it's like, once you unpack it, you realize that how, this, this is, uh, yeah, it doesn't fit the second time around. So exactly. How did I get this here? <laughs> so, so that's another reason to watch these things, even in, from a purely academic standpoint is look at how dense it is. Look at, and when I say dense, I mean that it's it's layered. It's 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 a uh, a lot of layers of things that are all being communicated instantly through the simplicity and clarity of the format, right? Yeah. Point three. This one's a really important one to me, uh, and I I struggle with this a lot, and I do my best to get this to achieve this in all of my work, and uh, it takes a lot of uh, intellectual work to get myself to this point uh, of uh, achieving kid logic. Did you ever watch Silverhawks, Rob? Oh yeah, yep. I, that's one of the Silver Silverhawks, Galaxy Rangers. Um, I didn't enjoy every one of the cartoons, and I was one of the kids who didn't identify with the kid vehicle characters. But uh, sure. <laughs> well, uh, even pretty young, I didn't. But um, uh, but I still love the series because they were made of more than just that. But uh, yeah, the Copper Kid was the kid vehicle character in this, mm -hmm. and of kid vehicle characters he's one of the less offensive in at least in the sense that he doesn't talk very much he doesn't he's not like snarf and the thundercats i get it why people hate him so much because he's got that snarf snarf thing that he does all the time and then they introduce snarfer later on and it's like here's an even smaller cuter version of snarf um i totally get why people respond the way they do to that right uh copper kid on the other hand not as talky 
you know, not as present. So I can see why this well, like film a, wouldn't bother people. I mean, I, I, I don't remember uh, Copper Kid being like, uh, as uh, bumbling or what have you. No, he was absolutely capable. He just, the, the only thing that was cute about him was that he was from the planet of the mimes. So he talked in this weird vocoded way and then he would whistle a lot to communicate. Right. I remember. Okay. Could, Thank you. <laughs> yep. He could talk, but it was like, he would only use a couple words at a time. And then you could almost not understand him half the time. Cause they ran his voice through this crazy, like hyper modulated vocoder. So, right. um, but, uh, but anyway, Silverhawks is, in my opinion, it has its problems. Uh, the, the, the acting on it was very stiff. The writing wasn't always that great, uh, even by even looking at it through the lens of kid, kid lenses. Uh, but in terms of sheer creativity, in terms of design, in terms of, of general concept, I think Silverhawks is one of the finest cartoons produced in the last 30 years. Uh, if you look at it f from that vantage point. And one of the reasons I think it's so excellent is it does, it plays with this kid logic in an exceedingly effective way um, to where it, where it's so full of kid logic that uh, it's one of the ones that I think a lot of adults have a hard time with. So when I, what do I mean by kid logic? Let me define this real quick. When you're on the playground and you're playing pretend with your friends, at least I did, and you would pretend I'm a cowboy, I'm a policeman, I'm a lizard from outer space, I'm whatever, I'm imagining. And my friends are all imagining the things that they're doing. You did things that didn't make sense sometimes, right? Uh, you would say, deflector shield, I got a deflector shield. Where'd you get the deflector shield? I just had one on my belt. You make it up as you go along. And sometimes when you're making stuff up as, as you go along, it starts to kind of break down in terms of like a, a linear logic or a realistic logic. Um, when I was a kid, I would play pretend with my friend John and my friend Carl. And Carl had a character named Digar who had big shovels for hands. And when he clanged the shovels, they would make shockwaves because mm. uh, the shovels were so big. Why did he have shovels for hands? I don't know, because it's cool. Uh, John's character was a guy called Tiger Trap. And he was an athlete. Why is he called Tiger Trap? I don't know. It sounds cool. Tiger Trap. Uh, my guy was Silver, who was a silver alien who had a, a, a purple magic glove that could summon warriors representing each of the chemical elements. Where did he get the glove? Why the chemical elements? Why is he a silver alien? I don't know. It's cool. We made it up as we went along. Uh, why are these three characters interacting with one another? Why are they in the same world? Because we're pretending. That's how kid logic works, right? You do it because it's cool, and you find the logic after the fact, and you let the whimsy do the talking, right? Does that make sense? Um, yeah, totally. And, does that sound like a... Okay. It's a little bit of the, um, I'm trying to think of the principle of design it reminds me of too, because it is sort of a ascribing meaning and context based on things that get introduced and, and, and purposefully trying to weave them together. And not necessarily out of a sense of logic, but out of a sense of uh, just the immediate impression that that somehow gives, right? Where I have big hands, if I clap them together, they would of course do a big shockwave. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. It's not just, see, there's a difference between doing something just because it's cool. Like, I knew a guy, um, I worked with a guy once who would use large words incorrectly. Now, I know I'm guilty of this myself, but this guy made like a, ra like a regular habit out of it. Dude, I'm right here. And I would say, <laughs> uh, but he, he, he was really just being in an office with this guy, listening to use, li listening to him use these large words where it was like just horribly incorrect, you know, like, um, I don't know. Like he would say the word cavalcade to refer to how long it took to take the elevator up. You know, it'd be like that wrong, you know? <laughs> and so it occurred to me that this guy doesn't even know what these words mean. He's just using words. It's weird. And so I said to him one day, I was like, hey, dude, could you define that word that you just said? He's like, no. And I said, well, then why are you using it? And he said, because it sounds cool. You know, okay, that's a bad reason to do something because it sounds cool, right? That's not kid logic. Uh, that's just, I don't know what that was, but, um, but kid logic is, yeah, it, it's, it, I love, I love this idea of like introducing the thing because it's interesting and then finding how it grooves into everything else after the fact, like sculptors who build things out of found objects, right? You know, you yeah. see somebody who builds an amazing sculpture out of things they found. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's an integration discipline and it's a little bit, a little bit like, uh, um, improv. Kid logic is an integration. 
I'm writing this down. Integration uh, discipline. <laughs> oh man, I am totally stealing that from my classrooms. Cool. So you missed my joke, and that's all right. But oh, what? What? No, I want to hear it now. Don't ask me to define it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it just sound cool. Exactly. Um, so, so for those who aren't terribly familiar with Silverhawks, because this this one, strangely enough, came up a couple weeks ago, like three times in three different conversations with three different groups of people, um, and I, I think I scared a couple of people with how eager and forceful I was talking about this subject. Um, but I, it's because I think it's such a good example. Okay, so Silverhawks, the, the follow up to Thundercats. Thundercats was a wild success uh, by by Rankin Bass Studios. Thundercats was a fantasy adventure story featuring characters with cat themes: Lionel, Tigra, Chitara, Panthro, etc. Fighting against the mutants and the evil Mumra, uh, an evil sorcerer mummy <laughs> who could turn into a muscle mummy. Pretty awesome idea. Um, mummy Hulk. So. So, so they bring along Silverhawks as the follow-up. Let's do animal themes again. Worked the first time. Why not? Okay, but what are we going to do differently? Well, Silverhawks will make it sci-fi. Okay. Uh, there'll be people with metal bodies in outer space. All right. Already it's starting to get kind of strange. Uh, what's, what's the premise? Uh, they are going to be uh, the untouchables in deep space in the future. What? Yeah, they're going to fight the mob. And there's a there's an intergalactic mob in the galaxy of Limbo, another galaxy. Why do they have to be sent from Earth? Oh, let's just forget about that for now. Let's just let's just follow along. Let's, they're going to the galaxy of Limbo, and they're going to fight against uh, the, an evil space Al Capone and his intergalactic mobsters. Oh, well, that sounds interesting so far. Yeah, yeah. And their their boss will be this grizzled old detective with a shirt and tie and suspenders who drinks coffee in his office. And you'll and maybe we'll play like cool old timey forties style or thirties style music uh, in the scenes whenever we show him. Wow, that's getting weird. Uh, okay, tell me about these mobsters. Uh, is it going to be uh, guys with uh, pinstripe suits and space guns? No, I think what we'll do is we'll have this guy who looks like a heavy metal rock star with an eye patch. And uh, when a certain moon's light shines on him, he'll turn into a spiky metal demon monster. Well, why does he do that? I don't know. Just bear with me because this is, this is visually kind of interesting. I mean, you know, heavy metal guy, big hair, and then all of a sudden he turns into a spiky demon robot. Oh, okay. Uh, well, what's his, what's his cronies going to be like? All right, well, we'll have a guy who has saws for hands and he talks like a buzzsaw. And let's just call him Buzzsaw. Why not? And whenever he talks, he'll say, rin, rin, before he says anything. Oh, well, that's weird. Oh, wait, there's more. Uh, we'll have this woman who has a guitar and crazy punko hair and, and her glasses. She'll have like uh, music note glasses. And she can, whenever she plays on her guitar, it makes destructive beams. Why is she playing a guitar? Why not just have a laser cannon? Well, because we want to call her Melodia, and uh, that sounds kind of like a cool, whimsical female character name. Uh, and we want to have a music theme to her, so you know, we'll just make her a guitar gun. All right, uh, we'll have a goblin in it from the, from the Lord of the Rings, who is a technical wizard and he's an inventor, but we'll give him a personality of a grease monkey mechanic, and we'll call him Hardware. Uh, wow, a goblin with a grease monkey mechanics personality who, who invents things? Yeah, 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 but there's more. Uh, the Monstar, the, the, the main bad guy who turns into the big spiky demon robot, he's going to ride around in a squid. A squid? You're going to have this guy ride around in a squid? Yeah, yeah, but it's a squid with armor on it, and it's in outer space. Uh, wh where did the squid come from? Oh, he just finds it, and then he shoots a beam out of his eye patch, which turns the squid into a crazy armored squid. How does that even work? Oh, but then we got to introduce the character Poker Face, who's a robot who has uh, slot machine eyes. What? You're, okay, you see where I'm going with this? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this whole thing is one big exercise in kid logic. And when you watch it, even as an adult, even as somebody who loves the show, I acknowledge the weirdness. Uh, they're riding around, like we're looking at this picture of Buzzsaw, Melodia, and Yes Man in one of the, the space cars. And they're old-timey 1940s cars that have just been kind of converted into rocket cars in outer space. No top. They're in outer space. How are they breathing? Who cares? If somebody gets knocked out of a car, they fall. They fall. They're just falling. And, like, and like you have to save them. Like, if, like, uh, if Copper Kid gets knocked out of a car, he starts falling, and Quicksilver will be like, oh, my gosh, I got to go save him. Why? He's in outer space. He'll just, you know, he'll kick on his jets, and he'll eventually fly back. Freeze or explode. What's that? All the above. Um, which, uh... That remind this was, oh gosh you remind, remind me of a couple of things so uh, I've I've brought this up before uh, Spelljammer right I just wonder which came first Silverhawks or Spelljammer because they were similar they had a they had a logic to it as far as like well why mm. how how do these ships work in space and basically it's saying I have this imaginative scenario 
And if you buy into the fun of it, well, here's a little bit of um, blocking around the fun. So we tried to pad it a little yeah. with some explanation, but not too much. Right, just enough. Which uh, and and there's uh, there's other. Uh, I'm sorry, they didn't verbally say that someone would fall. They just showed someone falling, but then then they would do that again if the same situation came up, right? So I think that's that's demonstrating a logic. Yeah, it had its internal logic because it didn't just happen once. It was a consistent thing. If you fell out of a car, you fell. Mm -hmm. And that was a problem. <laughs> Even though you could breathe in space, it's a problem if you fall out of a space car. Um, other things, like the fact that the Silverhawks shoot lasers out of their feet. Out of their feet! Why are they using guns? Well, because they had the creative problem of they have these wings that kind of come, extend out of their hips. They slap their arms to their sides, and when they extend their arms again, there's wings underneath. Well, now it's that they're, and they're gliding in outer space, so there's no atmosphere, I grant you, but they somehow it's some kind of crazy space metal that allows them to glide through maybe it's like a solar sail i don't know but in other in any case they can't use their hands so they put lasers on their shoulders and on their feet as a creative solution to the problem so it created these really interesting looking scenes where they would flip around and shoot out of their heels at people um and then also even in there's an extended intro to the silverhawks if you watch like the, from episode one I don't know. It's on YouTube, and I'll I'll look for, look for it to link to it in the show notes. But there's an extended like two minute long intro where it introduces you to the general premise of the world, hmm. and part of the language of that extended intro is born of a time beyond time. They sacrifice their human bodies to withstand the the long journey through space. Why do they have to sacrifice their human bodies to extend to withstand the long journey through space? Okay, but born of a time beyond time. That's even weirder yet. I mean, it's the future, but they're born of a time beyond time. It doesn't make sense, but it excites the mind to wonder. It sounds lofty. It's like Stan Lee language, right? It's not logical, but it sounds like it's coming from someplace high on, right? It's coming from another up on the mountain. The words come down, born of a time it's beyond time. It's, it's a little bit of an agreement. It's like say, starting a sentence out with once upon a time. It's saying, I'm here to engage you in a story. Yep. Let's... Exactly. You, and, and, and let's begin. So... I, I hope that that example makes clear what I'm talking about when I say kid logic. Can I bring it's, in another couple of examples. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, ah, yes, I did. Yes, thank uh, you, thank you for that cool. cue. So here's here's three more terrific examples. Uh, I just got the Challenge of the GoBots first miniseries on DVD, and I watched it, and I was a kid who was all like. Uh, Transformers are the real ones. GoBots are the fakies. I don't want GoBots, Mom. Whatever you do, don't you dare get me a GoBot. You bring a GoBot in my house, don't you think of it, right? I was that kid. Uh, but as an adult, uh, you know, I still watched the cartoon when it was on, but but when I was a kid. But now as an adult, I watch it. I'm like, oh my god, I love this show. Okay, premise very similar to Transformers. GoBots are two warring factions: the Guardians and the Renegades, on the planet Gobatron. Ugh. Uh, and then they decide, well, we got, uh, the Renegades, they want to stage uh, a new battle station or a battle, uh, you know, like they're regrouping. So they, like build up their resources so they can fight the Guardians and reclaim Gobatron. Oh, well, let's go to Earth. That seems like a nice place. Well, why are we going to Earth, Psycho? Is there anything there that we want? I don't know. Just it's Earth. It's got stuff on it. We'll go get it. They never say what they're really after. It's not Energon. It's not human slaves. It's just, we're going to go to Earth and we're going to build a base and we'll take out Gobatron from another planet. Okay, and then they get to Earth, and they're huge. They're thirty foot tall robots, and Psykill does not want to be seen by the humans. Whoa, wait, Crasher, don't go fight those humans. I, we can't be seen yet. Why not? You're the only thirty foot tall, crazy, powerful robots that shoot lasers out of their hands on the planet. The Guardians aren't here yet. What are you scared of, Psycho? I don't want to be seen. That's a recurring thing in the first miniseries. Look, we can't let him see us. What's he so scared of? Doesn't make sense, but it has its own consistent internal logic to it, right? If you take that leap and watch it in the spirit that it's intended, it's amazing fun. Uh, but if you watch it trying to get like a real, clear, adult perspective on what Psykill's motivations are, forget it. You're out of luck. Voltron Defender of the Universe. I know you've seen this one, Rob, yes? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's say it's like a Robotech fan, right? Oh, yeah. Big robot, huge sword. Heck, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious? <laughs> Still, still think it looks awesome. And uh, yep. yeah, but um, yeah. no, go ahead. What's uh, Kid Logic in but, in Voltron? 
But uh... well, the kid logic, the kid logic in Voltron, I think, is in the. Um, I'll be I'll be straight up. The dialogue in Voltron is not very good. Uh, it almost seems like the the dubbing team came in and sort of went. I don't know. What did he say? Uh, he says this and just jots off something and throws it out. Sure. Uh, there's a scene where Hunk is walking down. I'm sorry. What's that, Rob? What was the uh, the, the main bad guy of Voltron who, who always got all these failed robust pro- projects funded somehow? King Zarkon. Zarkon, okay. King Zarkon and Prince Lotor and Hagar the Witch, um, who were all played by Sunbow voice actors, actually. Like, uh, Zarkon was played by Jack Angel, who was wetsuit on G.I. Joe. Uh, he was Ultra Magnus on Transformers. Uh, uh Hagar the Witch was played by B.J. Ward, who was Scarlet on G.I. Joe. Uh, a whole bunch of characters on G.I. Joe, actually. Um, let's see. Neil Ross was Keith, the leader of the Voltron Force, who was Shipwreck on G.I. Joe. Um, and a whole bunch of heroes on the Sunbow series, like Visionaries and uh, Inhumanoids and even Transformers and so on. Um, but anyway, great voice cast. But the dialogue in the series is not very good. It's very weak. But because of that weakness... And I'm not trying to say that it's so bad that it's good, but because of that weakness, it takes on this kind of wonderful kid logic of, why did they say that? Uh, there's a scene where Hunk is walking down this this corridor, and Hagar the witch's cat is loose inside of the castle of lions. And they got to get it, because it's an evil cat. And Hunk says, where'd that cat go? And the cat jumps out of the shadow, scratches his face, and runs off again. And he says, now I know! You know, it, that, that's not a good line. <laughs> it's a bad line. There's... I need to track down this episode. I'm hoping the listeners can help me out. Uh, I I know I saw it, but I've, I have yet to. I've gone through like tried to rifle through a few old episodes to see when this happened. But there's an episode where Prince Lotor. You watch the the anime version, and he clearly asks for a drink, and then the drink is delivered, and he drinks it, and he says something. The lines they chose to have is, "Fetch me my mean potion." And they give it to him. He drinks it and says, "Ah, I feel meaner already." Now we're getting to like Dora the Explorer kind of dialogue, right? So not great dialogue, but you watch it with the eyes of, a, of an eight-year-old or a seven-year-old, and it's great. The opening credits of Voltron, there's full of this born of a time beyond time kind of junk. They say, uh, as Voltron's legend grew, peace uh, settled throughout the galaxy. On planet Earth, a galaxy alliance was formed together with the good planets of the solar system. They maintain peace throughout the cosmos or throughout the universe. Wait a minute. You said it was a galaxy alliance. Why is it the good planets of the solar system? Right? So, like, uh, Saturn and Jupiter and Earth teamed up and said, we're going to fix the galaxy. It's not a galaxy alliance, and it's a solar alliance. Get, get your story straight here, Voltron. Uh, but they don't need to. Because it's, again, using that kind of lofty language saying, here's what you have to commit to in order to watch the next 22 minutes. If you can listen to that sentence, and if you say cool, you're going to like this. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, just So jumping back to your anecdote earlier about the you had a coworker that would use words in uh, creative ways. So Nicely are played. you saying he had sort of a, a kid logic in, in like... <laughs> He, he just was using it because it was cool because Voltron clearly was not trying to teach cosmology, right? By oh, but my, my counter argument to you would be is that co- that coworker was just randomly using words to attempt to sound more intelligent and maybe more uh, have a richer experience than he really was having. I think uh, he felt that he had the uh, the, the the shockwave shovel hands. <laughs> And you were just, well, you weren't playing along, that's all. I wasn't playing along. Well, that's a nicer way to look at this guy than the way I looked at him. Uh, no, I, I'm totally but, silly here, but is maybe that's, that is, because it's interesting how we can, we can excuse it in one context, and uh, and I'm not trying to vilify it either, but, but it is right. interesting. Neither am I. How you can run into that in certain situations, and it can seem out of place, or like, well, hmm. But then Voltron, it's like, well, no, cool. I'm still into it. Okay, cool. I'm not. You didn't. You didn't sway me here by your misuse of those terms. <laughs> well, let me let me put it this way. Um, in the in the context of working with a coworker who's presumably as uh, educated and reasonable an adult as I am, or at least in the same ballpark, uh, for Kid Logic to enter into our normal discussion was incongruous oh yeah yeah it was it, it's not wrong of me to expect another adult to behave like another adult but it is wrong of me to expect an eight-year-old or a seven-year-old to use large words correctly 
right? If I were to say to that seven-year-old who said, uses the word cavalcade for going up the stairs or whatever, uh, what's define cavalcade for me? Well, you're stupid because you don't know that, right? That 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 is you know incorrect. That is uh, or not incorrect. That, that that's unfair of me. Um, and I think it's similar. It's it's similarly it's unfair to judge Voltron for its incongru incongruities or um, uh, lack of a realistic logic uh, because right up front they're telling you I'm a seven year old. Right. And Does that make sense? To a feeling and a message uh, overall. They they have a truth to them that they're that they're conveying, right? Yeah, and, and there's a general sense of what these words collectively mean. Mm -hmm. Cosmos, galaxy, universe, alliance, uh peace, uh horror. A new horror was uh, uh, threatened the galaxy, right? right? There's a general sense of what we're really talking about here and it's all just meant to make kids go <gasps> right? Oh, so, I'm listening. <laughs> yep. Yep. Did you say monster? Did you say horror? Did you say universe? Okay. <laughs> so last one I have, and there's more than this. This is just three that I collected, is the Care Bear Stare. Uh, this is one that, you know, it, if you're up at 4 o'clock in the morning and you're smoking a little something and you're saying, why did they stare out of their bellies? Right? Okay. You're missing the point. The point is, is that this is like a kid who says, you know, deflector shield. I'm making shockwaves with my hands. These bears have symbols on their chests, and they have to visibly express their power somehow. Are they going to shoot eye beams? <laughs> Are these cute little bears going to shoot eye beams out of the Care Bear stare? Gosh, that would look weird. I don't know if that would. I would feel right about that. Showing that to a six-year-old girl, you know. But their symbol emerging out of their torso as a beam of energy, it has its own consistent internal logic, right? And the Care Bear Stare does a lot of things. It could be used as a force of power to knock down a bad guy. It can be used to create, like they can make a bridge with it so that kids don't get hurt. They use the Care Bear Stare, like there's one episode where there's a go-kart race and there's these other kids who are cheating and the two young girls who are being cheated on, or rather they're, they're, the cheating is being done at their expense. So they lose the tire of their, their uh, box car. It was a box car race. Mm. And uh, Cher, I think it was Share Bear shoots the Care Bear Stare out of her chest and makes a little tire for, you know, like a heart-shaped tire for their their go or, uh, box car. You know, so the, the Care Bear Stare, what is it? It's a force that does good. That's all it is, you know? Let's not, let's not turn it into, is it, well, let's explore the nature of the Care Bear Stare. Is it science or is it magic? Is it something where the Care Bears are a highly evolved, uh, evolved form of life, that they can actually uh, generate light and kinetic energy out of their bellies? Uh, or are they from another galaxy, another universe where they have magic, right? That's where it breaks down. So I got to move fast through this last couple parts. We've been going a long time, Rob. Uh, point four, and I'll breeze through this one, playability factor. This is something I've been playing around with in my classrooms. Um, a lot of these things, you know, they were based on toys. It was a commercial. Yes. Okay. Well, let's look at what, what creatively came out of that. So you take, for instance, in the middle here, we've got the Wheeled Warriors. And I'll just I'll use this one particular example, and then we'll just move on. Wheel Warriors was a line of toys in the '80s where the the chief idea was. Let's see if it's on the next slide. Yes, uh, they the 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 tagline for the toy line was their quick change in fighting machines. It was a vehicle, and you could take off all its parts and interchange it with other vehicles. And the chief playability factor featured in the commercials. And remember, these 30 second commercials usually showed just about everything you could do with the toy. Uh, which was kind of depressing when you think about it. You could do everything you can with a toy in 30 seconds. Now get ready to do it over and over again. But um, the chief thing was you can stack an attack. And I have a really crummy screenshot there uh, from the commercial where there's armed force and drill sergeant where you can just stack them on top of each other. Well, if I've got one powerful vehicle and I put another powerful vehicle on top of it, now it's even more powerful, right? Uh, not the greatest idea for a toy. Although I bought it when I was a kid. I had armed force. Um, along come the cartoon writers and they're like, build a cartoon series around this toy. Ooh, what's its playability factor? Stack and attack, interchangeable weapons. And they did, they built an entire, uh, cartoon series, a, a long running cartoon series, or at least like a lot of episodes, hmm. uh, built around showing the vehicles doing exciting, uh, weapon exchanges, <laughs> but with real drama, you know, boy in quest of his father, uh, evil plant monster who wants to prevent this reunion between the boy and his father and then picking up helpers along the way. It becomes like a very Star Wars-esque kind of mythological story. Uh, but the big idea that I think is interesting is, and I've used this in my classrooms, is 
uh, invent a toy. Make up a cool toy. And the cool toy has to do something. It has to have a playability factor. And that playability factor has to be, you have to build a story around this thing, and the playability factor is the thing that has to solve the problems and the adventures of the characters, right? And that's what these writers were doing in the 80s. So people say, was it a commercial? Yes, it was. But it was also not a commercial in the sense that these guys were up against the wall with a very, very uh, high-stakes game of creative bingo where they had to figure out how to get this toy's function, the thing that makes it cool to play with, to also be a fun thing to watch on a screen with fictional characters, right? Sure. Limitations breed creativity. It's into uh, a metaphor for the kind of challenges they face and or a visualization of some capabilities or ideas. Like the Care Bear Stare. It's a way to visualize, instead of just showing a Care Bear staring at you, where it's like, guess what? You've got, this power is hitting you. Bam. Yep. It's like, no, it's actually hitting you. It's, it's I've got beams of light coming out of me and here it is. Uh, yep. Where... Uh, yeah, I, mean, I actually never watched Jason the Wheeled Warriors. I've heard there's like, uh, wasn't there a famous writer behind that series? Like, ooh, I'd have to look now. I don't remember. Jan um, Michael. No, J. Michael Straczynski. Was he behind that? Mike. There you go. I think so. I could be okay. wrong. I don't know. I'd have to. I'll have to research that one as a follow up. But um, I had friends into it. That. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's neat. But yeah, it's it's actually it's a good cartoon. Um, you know, I, we can watch it together when you come out here for KRC. Cool. Um, final point, and good for you too. Okay, so they say like this is full of sentimental, uh, pro-social drivel. Again, I ask you. Here's an image from 1984 where Winston is being tortured uh, at the end of the story, where they finally break his spirit, and then there's the My Little Ponies. Uh, I should have picked an image that was actually like a character, a cartoon character suffering in the context of a cartoon story, like how a cartoon character suffers. That would have been a better comparison. But again, we talk about which is more suited to speak to the experience of a child. Are they going to understand the horror of Winston's torture? Are they going to understand the gravity of when he says, do it to Julia, not to me? Uh, no. This is outside of their experience level. We're dealing with the language and the symbols that is appropriate to their their um, their development level, right? Um, and that's why a lot of these cartoon shows hire child psychologists to be advisors to it, to help make sure that the symbols are speaking to the age group that they're targeting. Uh, so again, it's not about dumbing it down. It's about using appropriate symbology, right? I, and just in case I didn't mention it earlier, when I, when I use that example of um, Door the Explorer and uh, Swiper, the, the sneaky fox. Uh, it was actually my wife that explained that to me. If I didn't say <laughs> that essentially credit where it's due. represents the intentions and desires of a toddler. And I went, okay. Right. So of course he's a hero. He's, he is just acting out on his toddlers. Anyway, um, that finding that in your writing voice and whatnot, or finding out how to identify to that with that to incorporate it. I mean, obviously I could see how it was critical for experts to be involved to help the writers, but I imagine the writers then started to, um, and naturally incorporate those, uh, developmental sure. concerns. I mean, I don't have anybody advising me on my stories, uh, but I've seen the, the, my target age group read my books and they get it. So, I mean, I think it's something that you can develop an ear for as sure. well. I haven't taken uh, metal guitar courses at a master level, but yeah, I've, I've, I grew up immersed in it, right? And Anybody who's heard the theme song? Practice it. That was Rob. Oh, so. anyway. Uh, but yeah, already I think we're falling out of sync with the Adobe Connect, so I got a blast of these final points. Okay. Um, but, uh, okay, so here's, here's three examples of cartoon characters and one comics character. Uh, and I'm going to invoke the words of Dan Mishkin. I think this is a great an analysis. As he said that superhero stories are dress rehearsal for, rehearsal for adulthood. It's a safe theater through which the children can play act through characters who are investigating these uh, iconic and vibrant choices in terms of characters and in terms of situations in a safe way so that when adulthood comes to go, this is just like the time when He-Man had to deal with this. This is just like the time when Spider-Man had to deal with that. Um, in, in, according to Dan, superheroes are not merely, or they're not even at all, power fantasies. It's not about, I, want, I wish I was strong like He-Man and I could punch people. It's about exploring these difficult choices that we will inevitably come up against as we grow up, but in the language that we can understand as a child. 
and I would even go further, and I'll point again to that Saturday Supercast uh, that you mentioned, Rob, uh, the He-Man analysis, where I break down, uh, in my opinion, what He-Man really in a symbol system represents. And it's very similar to what Zaro and Batman and all masked characters represent, is Bruce Wayne, Don Diego, Prince Adam are us as we are and should be. The imperfect us, the misunderstood us, the, the us that gets that screws up and gets humiliated all the time. And then the alter ego is us at, as we can and uh, as we can be and often, you know, us at our best. Right. It's us at, our, at the height of our power. But ultimately, we have to relinquish that power and have to return to be a, um, a goofy, muddled self-contradictory creature because we're human beings if we were always perfect we would be a monster if prince adam stayed he-man all the time he would be a monster if don diego stayed zaro all the time he would be a monster and so on uh it's a wonderful message to send children that it's okay and sometimes even preferable to be the goof and that's why i love the prince adam cringer he-man battle cat dichotomy is that cringer doesn't like being battle cat why wouldn't you like being a battle cat because he loves sleeping in the sun and eating and just being a cat he doesn't want to beat people up and that's awesome that that's presented as an option for children um so again we're dealing with you know very vibrant simple uh clear uh kinds of language with this stuff uh and then finally you know we get to the the morals at the end of all the episodes which a surprising amount of cartoons from like the late 70s and on have these where the character walks on and explains the story even transformers had uh, public service announcements for a little while there's at least a handful of them um knowing is half the battle there's those parody videos out there uh these stories often have some element within each individual story of something that you learn there's some message even my little pony friendship is magic you learn something through the vehicles of the ponies about how to behave as an adult uh you know uh, bragging uh whether or not like when, when when your old friends meet your new friends and the tension that arises out of that and how do you deal with that uh these things are all expressed through the story but it's and there's different degrees of volume to it. Sometimes the, the message is very loud. Sometimes the characters say the message in the context of the story. Sometimes that message is a little bit below the radar. Um, I'm not going to make a judgment as to which I like better. I like them both. Uh, and then sometimes you learn things like, for instance, when I was in high school, I knew what DNA stood for because of G.I. Joe episodes Arise, Serpentor, Arise, where they said deoxyribonucleic acid like 70 times in that miniseries. The building blocks of all life. Uh, so... There's this stuff is has stuff that's good for children because they're developing, they're growing, they're entering this world, and don't we want our our next generation to be as good as they possibly can be? Are, is it appropriate to say to a child, "You can't fight city hall kids, so don't even try"? Is that what you, the message that you want to give them? Uh, of course, you're going to put good stuff in a story for kids. It it, it seems foolish to me. That's like saying like. Oh, these this this baby food has vitamins in it. Whatever, you know. Are you going to make fun of that? Of course, you're going to put stuff that's that is essentially good for kids in the entertainment that they watch because you're trying to help them in every level learn. Rob, is there a moment in your day where you are not trying to teach your daughter? Right, even in play, right? There's teaching going on there. Yeah, yeah, and I, I actually, I once in a while, I think do I do this too much? I mean, we don't, uh, I don't, I don't do it in a way, I, at least I don't feel like it's some kind of, um, it's just, there, there's a lot of interesting Tactic. things in the world. Yeah. And, uh, um, it's no, what were you saying? Like to, Oh, I, sorry. I, I try not to some, some latency going in, a, in any kind of, um, overly, um, I don't know, some kind of uh, hierarchical teaching sort of thing. It just sort of uh, anything that comes up, there's there's things to investigate. And so we investigate a lot of things. And once in a while, I'll, I'll look at my daughter doing that a lot and think, well, maybe, uh, hmm, maybe I do that a little too much. Maybe we just should go bounce a ball off a wall or something. But even inherently, I'm going to think of something to well, say when we do that too. So she just, she just has to get used to having a, a dorky father. <laughs> Well, but th that's just it, though, is that 
kids are at that age and all throughout their development, the, the developing years, they're always learning because they're drinking in all this knowledge. Like, like, like uh, you look at any animal, every, even when cats play, that's all about learning for when they're becoming big cats. And then they do those things to each other. Um, they're oh, learning please, whether please. we please. are intending them to learn. Yeah, go ahead. I apologize. I, obviously we do have a little bit of a delay, but, uh, uh, I just, I, I really get excited about, uh, mentioning play as a learning kind of, um, kind of method, because of course play we have, we've made certain, uh, trade-offs a lot, like the, the, the choices made to have a, um, a storytelling model, like the one that you're presenting here, Jersey, where you've, you've taken away certain things saying, well, I'm not going to go to the heavy, dark places of humanity, but I am going to, uh, go interesting, dramatic places and, and be vibrant about it and have these, you know, uh, and play with those those choices. A lot like when you're playing a game, you have sort of a simplified rule system. Not everything is is fair and or in bounds and you enjoy the game because it has those restrictions, typically. Mm -hmm. um, and often gain extra lessons from that experience, like the like the kittens wrestling are actually learning how to, you know, dismember and defend themselves, uh, dismember others and defend themselves and kill prey and all that. But thankfully they don't play with and that live intent all the time. Exactly. And we don't, and the, the, the grown up lion doesn't look at the kittens and go, that's stupid what they're doing. I don't play that, that soft. I play rough. Right. So anyway, uh, so to wrap up now we're in the closure closure. What's this all got to do with storytelling? Well, if you didn't guess by now, ask yourself, if you want any of these things in your stories, I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize my five points, in and reword them a little bit. Do you want vibrant, recognizable characters? Do you want clear economical storytelling, even if it's long? Do you want imaginative worlds and ideas? Kid logic, everybody. And do you want unique functions for your characters? Do you want to come up with new ways for your characters, new inroads for your characters to get into the story? That's where we get into the playability factor. And then do you want your story to have a solid takeaway? Not a character turning to the camera saying, remember kids, but something where there is an essential meaning to the work. There is an intent in there. Uh, you could take the word moral out of these 80s cartoons or any cartoon for that matter. Again, My Little Pony, great example. The new Pony Show is awesome and I'm not a brony. I just think it's an excellently crafted show that plays on all the stuff that I'm talking about here. Uh, and every episode has a solid takeaway. It has a solid uh, intent. We can change the word moral to intent, and it completely changes its inflection. And you don't have to include all these things. I'm saying that these five things are just different pieces of the overall picture that you can take. And I wish my characters were a little bit more vibrant, but I don't really care about clear economical storytelling. Well, that's why this stuff is worth studying. That's why this stuff is, that's why this stuff holds up to me. So with that, I will close <laughs> and we will wrap up quick because yeah, we're closing in on two hours and I don't want to, I don't want to test the limits of Adobe connect any further than I have to. Um, but Rob, can I, can I just th throw out one request? Yeah, of course, Jersey. I, uh, I would love to do this as a full on class. I would love to do this as a, like either a one and a half hour or maybe a two part one and a half hour series, like, like a, like a three hour total, maybe four hour total, uh, workshop series for lean into art. Uh, but you know, it'd be really great if I could find out if anybody who listened to this today said, I would like more, you can, uh, send us a message via Twitter. We're lean into art on Twitter or I'm on Twitter. Uh, just my username is Jersey J E R Z Y Rob's at Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Let us know if you think that this would be interesting to take a full-on class about, because I have been doing this in my workshops here in Ann Arbor, and I've been uh, using these uh, teach. I've been using different teaching strategies to to teach these five things uh, through, you know, creating a fake toy line and building a story around it. And there's all sorts of little mini games that go along with that. Um, but this was the general outline of what would be covered in the beginnings of what would be covered in such a series. So. Um, but you know what, if nobody's interested, if this is just me just shouting into the wind, I'm cool with that because I think it's an interesting topic. Uh, but then I, I know not to develop it into a workshop. <laughs> so I'll just keep teaching it in my classes here. I actually, yeah, I'm really curious to, to hear about the reaction because, uh, I, th I can easily see some super interesting, uh, interactions and exercises coming out of this too. Um, I think it would stand great as as a lecture, but knowing typically how how you work, I assume there's going to be some very 
interesting interactions in trying to experiment with these ideas that would get woven in there. Yeah, that was it. That was the only request I wanted to make was, uh, was that. So thank you, Rob, for letting me shout for a couple hours. My pleasure, Jersey. This is awesome. I, I dig this topic. I, I feel like I got a, a, a few interesting storytelling ideas just from our conversation. So, um, Thank you, Jersey, for putting this together. <laughs> okay, well then, let's get out of here. Let's go back to our lives uh, and uh, maybe watch a couple cartoons. And so until next time, everybody, I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I have been Rob Stenzinger of Interactive-Storyteller.com and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, bye.